Here we go. Streets and Scholars, Alex Alonso and Bear here to bring you guys another banger. And I'm here with one of my, and I ain't even exaggerating, man. I probably ain't never told you this, but I'm over here with one of my favorite Crips. <laughs> I'm, I ain't even exaggerating. Uh, I remember the day I met you, man. In fact, at the forum, at the Great Western Forum in Inglewood. What year was it? See if you remember the year. I don't. Um, I, I want to say like about 91. No, it was it was in the uh, 2000s. It was like a. Th- oh yeah, no, 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 no. You're right. 2007 or eight. Yeah. And I was there for my man T. Rogers. No, I thought it had to be older, longer than that because Baby started 2008. I I was there when you, I was there. That interview that we first did was when Baby was brand new. Right. You had the baby shirt on. Yeah, it was 2008. And I was there for T. Rogers, who I grew up with. Oh, boy. Hey, I got a bunch of T. Rogers stories. Rest in peace, um, T. Rogers. Rest in peace, Dwayne Mel Boy. And to his son, again. Lucky. I don't know. Did you know his son, Lucky, yeah, that, that I, passed also? I didn't know him that good. I met him. I, uh, interacting with T, I ran across him a couple of times. And you were there with Swanee Fly. Yep. And we was there at the Great Western Forum. I, I did my first little interview with you. It was a short little interview. Put you on. Sh- put you out there. from Swan. Shaka from Swan was there. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and we've been rocking with each other ever since, man. Yeah. And uh, I appreciate you coming in for another episode of Streets and Scholars, man. And uh, we also tapped in again on another interview at, um, you just corrected me off camera, not Edison, but at um, Charles Drew. Charles Drew. And that's one of the schools that you do outreach work under your nonprofit, which we'll talk about a little later. That's where the Crip started at. Uh, yeah, huh? Fremont and Charles Drew. Yeah, because uh, th- did Raymond actually attend Charles yeah. Drew? Most, most any, most of your top of the line gangbangers. I don't care whether it was Bloods or Crips. Uh, if their name was big, they come up out of Charles Drew. On the east side. Yeah, on the east side. I'm talking about the dude from Piru, uh a couple of Bloods from Swan. Just anybody that really, because you got to remember, in L.A. back in them times. Most blacks was all on the east of the 110 freeway. So, you know, a lot of, you know, that Drew was kind of considered a gladiator school. Now, at that time, uh, uh, Raymond Washington lived on 76. So how far from where he lived was Charles Drew? Probably, um, so San Pedro in 76, Drew was on Firestone and Compton Avenue. So um, not that far. Only other schools they had, like, back then for Raymond in them time was um, Bethune, Drew, Edison, and and the one the one for delinquents too was on the east side. Reese, Reese, yeah. I was just gonna say which was Bethune. <laughs> okay, that's Bethune now. Yeah. Okay, so well, no, wait a minute. I think it was. I'm not sure. Don't hold me on that. But Reese actually had all the quote unquote bad kids. If you couldn't go to none of the other schools, you went to Reese. Yeah, that's a, I learned that from my. Um, my connection with uh, Donald Archie, uh, one of the co-founders of the West Side Crips. He yeah. said he actually said he met Raymond at Reese. Yeah. Back in whatever years he would have been in junior high school, that would have been who oh. 70, 68, 69. There was a like, middle junior like, high. Yeah, like seventy one. No, nah, because they were born in fifty three. So let's say. Oh four, no, you're right. If fourteen years old, if you're born in fifty three, that takes you to sixty seven. See, if you was gonna ask me these questions, <laughs> you should have told me to call my big, my uncle big time. Or my, because them come, my uncle Paul Bunyan. Because uh, had them come back then. Junior high school, which is what we called it back then, was sixth grade, seventh grade, eighth grade. Right. And you hit the sixth grade at the age of thirteen. No. Yeah, no, you're right. Yeah, you're so right. so if you're born in 53 or 54, you're hitting Reese at uh, 1967, 68, 69, and that's where they met. I was a baby. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, so, uh, man, we got a lot to talk about, but the first thing I wanted to talk about with you, man, uh, let's talk about this relationship stuff because uh, that's a hot topic online, man. There's a whole bunch of uh, quote-unquote relationship experts, man, and we were talking about dating younger women, dating older women, dating women that are already baby mamas and then mm-hmm. adding another baby to it. And, um, you know, br- briefly, uh, how, many, how many kids do you got? I got seven. Damn, I didn't even know that. Seven kids. How many? Six baby mamas. Six baby mamas, seven and kids. rest in peace to um, my first baby mama. She just passed not too long ago, Diane Thomas. Uh, yeah, we was kids. Okay. We, we had a, my daughter's 38 now. Uh, we had her when we was 14, 15 years old. 
So, you know. So how old's your oldest and how old's your youngest? My oldest is uh thirty eight, my youngest is two. Damn, that I, I don't think I've ever heard of a thirty six year difference between oldest and youngest. And I don't need Viagra. <laughs> <laughs> I don't need Viagra at all. Oh. Hey, the funny that you said that is, uh, I was at this uh, comedy thing and uh, Carlo Miller's came out and me and my girl was sitting in there and he got a joke where he's talking about uh, kids being uncles and all that shit. And my, my son is a great uncle because <laughs> one of my sons had a little girl, so he's a great uncle. I'm a great, that's my first grandchild, great grandchild. I got two. You got grandkids that are older than your youngest kid. Yeah, my son is too. Yeah, so... And he's their uncle. <laughs> now, now, can you see how some people see this as a problem that you having multiple kids by multiple baby mamas? Because how how can you be a daddy in how many um, six households? Oh, I'm glad. I'm glad you asked me that. It's it's not that situation. So for me, this is the situation. Each one of my kids I had was different relationships, and they're spread it apart. Uh, my oldest daughter I had as a kid, me and her could not have a relationship. It was sexual. And she, I grew up with her. I knew her. She was my friend. She was like the girl in the neighborhood, the whole little nine. And, you know, she was the girl that everybody protected. And we ended up doing some shit. And, bam, I had my daughter. Uh, that was my first interaction. My family wasn't the type to take care of the kid for me. So I had to learn how to be a man at the age of 15. But I was in YA. So I didn't get to interact with my daughter until I was she was two. So I was 17 by the time me and her interacted. But um, it, it's, 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 it's a, like a, a slippery slope is a funny situation because, you know, with her, we was kids and there was no real love like situation where we was spending a long time with each other and none of that. Hell, I was in camp most of the time. So, you know, it was different. And then after her, I didn't really want no more kids, so I was plastic man for about 12 years. And then my other son came. And then uh, I had Taj, and then I had Tyreek, and then I had my daughter, Kobe. And then each one of these, you got to remember, each step is a different relationship with me with a different woman. And I ended up making kids in each one of these relationships. My two-year-old is my girl that I'm with today. You know what I'm saying? And we made a son, and that's that's my kid. And I'm, I'm that type of dad. I'm going to be there. A lot of people know me. A lot of people know my brothers. A lot of know us, and we take care of our kids. You know, You're know, probably a better father now than you was uh, 20 years ago. Oh, 100%. 100%. Um, um, I understand the sacrifice. I understand, um, you know, the lead. Um, I don't want to jump the gun, but... I've changed my life in a situation where my kids can hold their heads up instead of like, damn, my dad was this dude, this dude, this dude with the other stuff that's behind me, my past and what they say about me. So, you know, yeah, I'm a 100% a different dad. I'm more of a dad than anything. Now, um, how many of your kids end up in the streets as they grew up? Not one. Not one. Not one. Hey, man, we got a... Uh... It's, it's hard. Wanted, it's yeah. hard for most brothers to say that, you know. And no, that's no shade to any of my friends, my homeboys out there that got kids that bang, because I know it's hard. Let me say that on this. I got something to say on that. So, for me, and I'm saying this to any gang member, if you would walk your kid down this road and you know this road is nothing, is negative. Some of the stuff I do in schools and I talk about, I, I challenge kids. I put $100 on the table and I say, if you can name me a successful gang member, you can have this. And they'll tell me Nipsey. They'll tell me Cube. They'll tell me. I, I even had a kid smart enough to say me. And I said, no, I'm not a successful gang member. I'm a successful businessman. I'm a successful um, preventionist. That's it. You know what I'm saying? I walked away. Snoop and them was rappers. Nipsey and them was rappers. They weren't, they weren't successful gang members. They was just, they was able to horn who they was and become something else with that reputation still behind them. You know what I'm saying? Because there's a lot of dudes that tried to juggle both and they couldn't. You know what I'm saying? They lost their life. They went to jail for life. I'm just blessed and I'm lucky. Trust me, I could have easily been in jail doing life. I've been shot 10 times, nine different occasions, and my homies know it. And 
I'm standing and I and I just, you know, God got me and I know that, you know. And for those that are listening to Streets and Scholars right now around the world and they don't know Bear's background, you came up out of the 7-6 East Coast, is no? No. Where'd you come up out of? I come out of East Coast. Okay. So that's First Street, 190. Now we got 1200 and, 20, and 2400 blocks. So I come out the East Coast. Okay. So you like to just um, make I, it all in unity. Right. For us, our teaching... I, I come if you're gonna give me a designated area, eight nine. I'm sorry, you was you at the eight nine. My bad. Right. I said seven six. Yeah, two right here. Eight nine. But I'm saying if you're gonna give me a designated area, eight nine. Yeah. But my teaching, uh, if you're looking at East Coast, is we had a time where we said Coast Love, we bang Coast Love, and we really meant that shit. You know, that was our unity, that was our connection, that was our hold. And so, if if there was incidents where I was on uh, Lock High School campus, and we had the homie Snap from Q with us, and it's me and my boy Sleep, and we came through the garden area, and there's about 20 main streets. They in there, and they tripping. They looking for Q102s. They looking for whatever East Coasters they don't like, but you got to remember at this time, all the hoods are starting to try to figure out who they're going to be, where they're going to be, and what they're going to be. And so it's just growing. Raymond Washington's story is growing because he his thing was to consolidate the east side and so it's growing you know what i'm saying there's gangs that was going to be east coasters and there's gangs that wasn't the main streets was never trying to come into our car but they had a lot of love for like my big old boy gangster john they and then the ones that went to school with us at drew remember i told you a lot of your real gang bangers went to drew and so I can remember they came, we walked into the garden area, and my, my, my boy Snap, Lil Snap from Q102, and his, bro, his cousin Vic from Main Street, they was getting at him, and they got into each other, they kept hollering, nigga, you got a problem with Q, you got a problem with Main, you got a problem with Q. So Steel Bill from Main turned to me in big sleep, and he said, uh, which East Coast y'all from? And I said, which one you don't like? He said, I don't like Q102, and I don't like 11 8. I said, well, I'm from 11 Mate. <laughs> and my homeboy Sleep said he was from Q102. But like EJ, VJ, Red, all these other dudes that grew up with me as kids from Main Street was like, no, they're not. They're from 89. I said, no, right now, where we at now? I'm from Q102. Sleep said he's from 97. We just tell them we East Coasters, period. We didn't give a fuck. Whatever's going to happen, it's going to happen. But because we stood our ground as young dudes, Steel Bill, Truck, and all these dudes was older guys. And they was like, these little motherfuckers is down. They said they with it. So, boom, we leave out. And we walk out and, like, Soul from 9-7, my boy Tub from 9-7. And then there was a couple of other dudes. I'm not going to say their names, but they got booted from 9-7 for this day. We coming out the backside of uh, Lock onto 109th, and they're ahead of us. As soon as they get out the gate, I mean, the main street's up there thick. They're up there about 20, 30 thick, and they're in a line, and we got to walk past them, and they say, uh, we walking, and the, them dudes get outside the gate, and they like, fuck, skirt, and run. You feel me? And then Bill and them, like, look at us, and any any of us from 8-9, we kind of knew they weren't going to fuck with us because they fuck with Gangsta John and certain homies from 8-9, and... They ran out, boom, they say, see, see what they just did? But we're going to let y'all roll. We ain't going to trip. And they let us roll, and they didn't fuck with us. And then when we got to the hood, we did what we had to do when we hollered about homies, and a couple of these dudes uh, ended up getting booted, getting whooped on. Uh, 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 J-Dog from 9-7, he got booted, and he became Fly from 5-9 Hoover. Now, 5-9 Hoover is where he really made his name at. But when he was from eight nine seven, you know he was cool. But like I said, they did some hook shit and they got they got checked for it and they had to get the fuck on. This is the early stage, what I'm telling you about. And so, you know, we really bang coast love. We bang that shit. If the homie got shot somewhere, motherfuckers came from everywhere, and we pushed. I don't give a fuck if it was on first in the Liso Village. I don't give a fuck if it was sixty second all the way out to one nine zero. We pushed. And we mounted up. And when you seen us, we was coming. That's why they used to call us Coast Nation. And they didn't really want to fuck with us when it was all of us. And so, you know, this was something that Raymond put in play when he was, you know, 
with the six because he really fucked with a lot of homies down in that six pack area, and so he he gave us the the foundation to move forward on what we was doing. I think he actually started Sixty Second Street. No, you don't think so? No, six nine more. I think he's more six nine. Uh, six six deuces was a, uh, I believe it was Esquire's, and my homeboy Duck was with that, and so. Six Deuce and Eight Nine is more connected solo. A lot of people don't understand that and don't know that, but actually, my homeboy Gangsta Ron is who created the neighborhood long before Sixties was neighborhood. Gangsta Ron created neighborhoods and Eight Nines was neighborhoods. The first there was Eight Nine, there was Eight Eight Crazy Boys, and then they switched over to Eight Nine. And because of John Slaughter, which is Wolf, major name in the game, Ducky Boy, major name in the game, so Duck was able to get the Deuces a turn with us neighborhood. So you're saying the eight nines were the first neighborhoods? Original neighborhoods. Matter of fact, you even got it on one of your street things when you're talking to Quake from Six Deuce and he tell you eight nine started neighborhood. I actually think Kev Mack did that interview. Okay. Yeah. But I thought it was yours. <laughs> yeah. But I'm saying he told you. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And and so for us, eight nine and six deuce is always a lock, a connection. Uh, we was raised not to bang against each other, not to trip with each other, not to fuck over each other. And we kept it solid. And then when the East Coast rolled in with the Six Nines, which they was, a, at first they were Shack Boys, and then first they was Castle Crips, and then they were Shack Boys, and then they thought up East Coast. And so we merged, neighborhood and East Coast. And so then it was this and this, and two, you know, two fingers and a thumb, no matter where you threw it, we was there. And so this upbringing was, we were solid with each other, and we was able to keep the funk from each other. If if if, if a homie did something stupid, in any end of the neighborhood, and when I say any end of the neighborhood, from 190 to First Street, you did something wrong, they'd deal with you and then call the hood and say, "Look, we got woo woo. He did some mark shit, and we gonna deal with him." Okay, I want I wanted to still uh, piggyback off of what you said earlier about having all these kids because you just mentioned you have a two year old. And um, I wanted you to expand on that. Um, Finally made a junior. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you got you got a, a junior, a bear, a Charles Junior, I guess. Yes. Uh, my other ones is my juniors too, man. It's just I didn't like my name. I'm a ju- I'm under my dad, and my dad is under my grandfather. I just didn't like the name Charles, so I used to have these little names, alias names. I was Taj sometimes to girls, sometimes I was Tyreek, and so when they was born. Each one of them got one of them names. And, um, you know, they're my, they're my boys. They solid as a motherfucker. They grown. They 26, 25. One went to the Marines. One worked for baby right now. Um, you know, we go through our ins and outs, but they're my boys. So you, you got a son that went into the armed forces? Yeah. Oh, man, congrats on that. Thank that, you. Tell him thanks for his service. Tyreek Maurice Spradley. Hey, we, <laughs> we, we appreciate your service, Tyreek. So so how old is the the baby mama for your newest kid? She's 32. Oh, she's young. Yeah. She real young. Yeah, I, mean, I don't know what you mean by young. She grown. She grown, but 32 is pretty young. She ain't 19. She ain't 18. Yeah. She's grown. Yeah, but uh, there's got to be at least uh, a couple decade uh, age difference there between yeah, you and her. Definitely. Yeah. So uh, how, how does that, how is it dating a younger woman and why, why go that young? All right. So... Well, that's like a three-part question. <laughs> <laughs> so if you're talking to the younger me, the party me, it was accessible. And to be for real with you, they there, they see me making money, they want to fuck, period. And so that was that. Um, each one of my baby mamas, I, didn't, I got six. Each one that I've messed with and dated and been dealt with is I actually, we lived together and we really went through shit together. We, we got years together. Um, the, the one that I had the most years with, her uh, name is Tanil. Uh, we had 17 years. We went through a lot of bullshit, a lot of hell, but uh, she was the female that I wanted to be with, you know, prior to my oldest daughter. So she became my oldest daughter's stepmom. We raised, we raised her together, you know what I'm saying? And, um, it was it was that way, you know. For me, with this age bracket and these baby mamas, it, it wasn't a trip about that. It was the connection mostly, you know. what I'm saying if they couldn't do nothing to help me or, you know, keep up with where I'm going, I didn't I didn't fuck with them, 
you know, any of these females, any one of them that I fuck with, they was capable of keeping up with what I was doing. And hey, they went saggy asses and saggy titties and fat <laughs> bellies and big chins. So a lot of a lot of older women are going to feel a little disappointed in that, that they, they want to date guys like you your age. But they already know guys like you are looking at the younger woman because of what you just said about the, the the physique, right? No, come on, because I got an answer for you. You just Well, you said the saggy titties and, and this, that, and the other. I, I didn't get to go where I was, I was going with it because I know we finna holler about this. So when I'm saying that, I'm saying true that. That's just like, look, I'm a big man now. You know what I'm saying? I can show you pictures of me, a slim dude. Yeah. You know? Um, and, you know, I, when I came home from YA, I was right. I had a V, I was good. But, you know, money, hustling, doing my shit, uh, I'm this. So when I'm fucking with an older woman and she's slower than where I'm moving, it, it's not going to work. And it's, it's not to say that there's nothing wrong with an older woman. An older woman is straight, but if she's on her game and she's keeping her, trust me, I got many older women I, I fucked with when I was doing parties and doing my shit. You know what I'm saying? I, I just seen one at a funeral that came and me and her and fucked around a few times, but we fuck around when we see each other and she keeps herself in shape. Shout she, out to all those women that are 45 and over and are fine still. We're going to go 40 fine. and over. For, okay, 40. 40 and older. We can go even 40 and, and, and over. And I agree with you. Uh, shout out. Much <laughs> respect to you guys. Every one of you guys, has any of y'all listen to this, y'all know me personally. I'm not no fuck-ass nigga, and I don't sit there and disrespect you and say all this. I, you get my, my sincere love. You get my sincere respect. I, I work with you, and we, we, our problem don't be that. Our problem might be something else. You know, uh, older women are hella smarter, and they require extra shit they want, and, and it's like they're more controlling, you know, and they don't understand, like, for instance, for my lifestyle, for over 26 years, I was throwing parties. So I'm at a club. I'm finding clubs. I'm partying. I'm with rapper dudes. I'm fucking with everybody. And, you know, my party's going up. And I got this young motherfucker. They grown, young, saying, hey, I'm fucking with them. It's, it's that simple. It's, it's, you know, what's up, you know? And you run across some of these motherfuckers that get in the club, lie, say whatever they are, but that's not the intention. But when you, when you if you fucking with somebody and you connect with somebody, you're not tripping. As long as they can measure up to what you where you at and what you're thinking. Because if you're talking to a kid and the kid is talking about bubble gum and this shit, you're not going to fuck with that. You can't. You know what I'm saying? But motherfucker doing shit, they working, they got jobs, and they doing this shit. That's where a motherfucker be at. Like, okay, I don't want no bitch I got to take care of. And I'm, excuse me, I'm not calling all you women bitches. It's just a slang. I'm saying, you ladies, you know, that's not where we at. That's not what we chase. Well, that's not what I'm chasing. You know what I'm saying? I'm chasing if you're capable of fucking with me on my level of what I'm doing, I can fuck with you. Now, a lot of younger women in their early 30s, such as your current baby mama, and even in the 20s, don't mind messing with older guys. Uh, t talk a little bit about that. What do you think it is with women that are as young as 25 that don't ma mind messing around with a guy 40, 45, 50 years old? Well, I haven't been in that situation, but I just say this. For me and from what I see, and I think any man out here see you, you meet a 25-year-old, you know she just want to, it's, it's a pleasure game. It's what you got, how you looking, and what, what you, it's the same way a dude will look at a female. Okay, she bad, she got a nice body. Ooh, but yeah. we don't look as good as we did when we was 21 years old, but we can still get that 25-year-old female. Yeah, because we smarter. <laughs> we get money. We doing stuff, you yeah. know. And that 25-year-old looking like, man, that motherfucker over there making money. That motherfucker driving a nice car. That motherfucker got jewelry. That motherfucker, everybody know him. Yeah. You know, there's draws for them to us. There's draws for us to them, you know. But if I'm in a situation and I'm with a, like I told you, my first, my, my, the, my longest relationship, I didn't give a fuck about all that. I just gave a fuck about her. It's just me and her couldn't last because she was a Leo, I was a Leo, and everything, you know, I'm not with, if I'm doing my job, you're not going to challenge me. And I'm not trying to control you. I'm just saying to you, look, I don't want to fight every fucking day. I don't want to get up and I got to defend or I got to 
argue with you about bullshit. You know what I'm saying? When you see that I am a capable man, not not no lazy motherfucker laying around and you taking care of me. I'm bringing more money in than you are. I'm doing the shit that I'm supposed to do. You know what I'm saying? Then you measure up with me and let's do this. So for me, there is no thing like that. If you capable of standing with me and you capable of rolling with me and you capable of understanding me and you bringing in just as much, or are you going to move me forward? I'm fine with it. But other than that, you know what I'm saying? Younger, older, it doesn't matter. It just depends on who the person is and whether she's 40, 50, 23, 29, 70. If she come on board and she say, you my boo, you my guy, I got you. And she got me? Come on. Why the fuck would I go play? Yeah. It ain't nothing to play with. I mean, if they 70, they can't really take the dig. But, you know, I'm just saying real is real, you know. Uh, shit, if you look back to the old days, women was young, fucking with older men, marrying older men, period. The parents was giving them to older men because they want the kid to be, the girl to be taken care of. And if I remember uh, if reading this history, some of these girls was as young as like 12, 13. 13. Yeah. You feel me? Yeah. And they was giving them. Yeah. Like, come on, I want you to marry my daughter because you got wealth. For us, it was a different thing and it's a different training. And this shit is, it really is hereditary. And those relationships lasted decades. Decades. My grandmother, my grandmother moved from Mississippi with my grandfather and never, ever been with another man. She was a, 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 a anointed woman. In church, she's part of the reason I am the man I am now. She's like a big part of it. Even my shit that I'm doing, my program I'm doing, she was a big part of me creating this program and doing this program. And we'll get into that later, but I'm just saying to you, you know, back in the days, I even look at a lot of shit, and I don't want to be rude to nobody, but I'll show you something real quick. Back, let's just say the 50s back, no, let's just say the beginning of the 60s back where men were men in the household and women was women in the household you didn't have to worry about the women cheating you didn't have to worry about the women being promiscuous uh, sneaking out bringing somebody in the house doing nothing you know what i'm saying very rare very very rare. rare but there was a lot of bullshit going on where these men that i don't agree with was just beating on these women that's you know what I'm saying? Yeah. If you caught her and she was doing something, I got nothing to say. But if she, you just come in and you mad tonight and you want to kick her in the ass, you fucked. You're a fucked up dude. But that shit, you got to always remember, even for the blacks, you got to always remember this. You guys got to understand where ass whoopings came from and the way people think came from as far as blacks. Ass whoopings came from, they was trying to save your life all the way from back in the 1400s. You know what I'm saying? They whooped your ass well because you wasn't supposed to look at a white person crazy. You wasn't supposed to do nothing. Emma Till went down there and whistled. And it, it was fucked up. And people watched him get killed. You feel me? So from them times to this time, it's a whole different story. It's a whole different demographic. And you got to look at it as so. You know, once they gave black some kind of rights, the women started fighting. Not just black, white women, all women had to fight for their rights. And we all went into gay rights and all these other rights because they all built off this one situation of blacks trying to be recognized as humans. Your, your, your ass whooping, man, my mom's whooped my ass. You know what I'm saying? I can remember a principal, uh, his name was Mr. Thrash. I know he ain't here no more, but Mr. Thrash was a black man. And at this time in schools, you get SWATs. We was, we, me and my brother got a SWAT. And this is when ADHD first came into the picture. And he called my mom and she, he told my mom, has, he, has they been tested? And she was like, tested for what? And she, he said ADHD. And she didn't know what they was talking about because we didn't, you know, it was just some, a term that they was trying to give us, a label they wanted to give us. And my mom said, I'll tell you what. Send them home. And I'm talking about Dwayne Spratley and Charles Spratley, Craig Spratley. Send them home. And we had a street, Zamora, that walked from Russell Elementary straight down to the house. And we knew it. When we walked to that door and my mama was sitting on this couch, there's going to be some ass whooping. If she was sitting over here, you might can talk your way out of it. Damn. 
No, serious. And um, what was those ass whoopings like physically? Man, water holes, Oof. belt, and stitching cord, whatever she could grab. Broom. T- today you go to jail for that, huh? Hell yeah. But I thank her for what she did because she did turn us around. You know, shit. My brother Craig is a, uh, what they call a super IT now. You know what I'm saying? Did any of you guys regret those types of uh, disciplines? At, 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 I, I hated at, them. Yeah. At the time. I, you no. regret. But what about when you look back at it? That's what I'm saying. I hated them because she wasn't playing. But she was considered the ass whooper of the family. Period. I don't care who kids came. They all told them, sit down because them are going to trip. And she's going to do you like she do her kids. She's going to whoop your ass. She's going to get you. So, you know, we... We had a big family. My grandmother had uh, 13 kids, and every one of them had kids. And so majority of us was boys, and, uh, you know, it was ugly. I want to give a shout-out to my cousin Nate. He just died the other day. Um, But all of us grew up in the same household, same grandfather. Uh, My grandfather was Arthur Smith. Uh, He was a pitcher for the Negro League back in the days. They called him Smitty. They called him Grassman because he could pitch. You know, then uh, as he got older, they ended up running a liquor store on 90th and Central. And uh, right when we was kids and when the gang shit started, and I'm telling you, I, I had to bust on the, I had shot at the families, and my grandfather just had, he came out the door and went back in the door. We ran across, we did it, and we ran past, and he didn't see us. But he came home, and he said, man, these dudes just came and shot some people, and yada, 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 yada. And, you know, we here we are, we sitting there, and we looking like, wow. <laughs> You know, he just missed us. But like I said, man, the, 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 it's the times that's, that's been turned and made shit, uh, like, to me, worse. Okay. Now, you mentioned uh, these parties that you were throwing and meeting all these women. Let's talk a little bit about that. Because before I even met you, before I even knew you, I used to hear about these parties. I used to see <laughs> these parties actually on the news sometimes. You was on them parties. <laughs> I was mad at you then. No, that was actually Chris Blashford from Fox 11 News. That wasn't well, me. John Beard. John Beard, yeah. But- and I was I was hot because they brought you in and you was talking about the cohesiveness of the Crips. You were just talking yeah. about the book stuff. But there was a dude out there that was shooting the footage and giving it to Fox 11. It wasn't me. Well, I, fi- I found out later. That guy's resting, actually. I forgot his name, but he used to... Um, I don't uh, know how he was getting that uh, footage. I, I know who he is. He was with Snoopy Blue and Spider. Uh, no, I don't and- think he was... He wasn't affiliated. He was, he no, was- he was with him. I know his name. He had the dreads. Uh, they brought him and asked me could they do their video on one of my things. Uh, so for me, um, them parties was with what I what I called hood days, and we started them. I started them. When did they start? Eighty eight, like eighty eight. I used to clown when I was in YA, and I used to. My birthday is July twenty seventh, but I'm from eight nine East Coast, and so August eighth. I mean, August is the eighth month, ninth. It was August 9th, so we created eight month ninth day. And so at this time, and Queek, all you dudes know, all you crip niggas that used to from the West and everywhere came up to the park, y'all know. So when we threw the first party, it was a day party. I was able to rent Washington Park Pool. And um we had this big ass party. I'm talking about the sheriffs there, everybody at the gates and trying to look in. One day I give you the footage, I got it on CD. I, my boy was there to transfer it from me. It was in video, but uh, my boy, uh, uh, um, damn, his brother is Carl and then his brother. They, they stayed off 112th in uh, San Pedro. They used to coach football at Locke, but uh, Mike, Mike Evans. So Mike and them, would, uh, I got them as DJ, and they came, and we, we had this big-ass Doodle Brown contest. This one, Doodle Brown came out. We had this big-ass contest, and when we was up there, the party, it, I mean, it cracked. We had over, we had over five hundred motherfuckers in there. We had motherfuckers Damn. all up on top of the roof, and we had people all on the deck. The sheriffs there, they not tripping. And then we made food. We was feeding everybody that was there. We 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 literally took our money and bought a gang of food and shit. And so my boy Queek from a, uh, a Trey Hoover died. Uh, high for uh, you know dudes from Hoover, Rick. All these dudes would come over to the parks. They weren't scared. They didn't have no problem because we was Crips at that time and we weren't tripping on each other. And so once we threw that party, Quake and them turned around, Quake and them turned around and invited us to Manchester Park 
for the first a trade day. And we, me, four of us went over to me, Lex, Lil CJ, and J-Bone. Is this kind of like the beginnings of hood days? Hood days. Because for, this is a, a 80s thing, right? Yeah. A late 80s thing. Yeah. Because there well, were no hood days in the 70s. No, it was like 87 when we did the first one. 87, then 88 is when it really took off. So 87 was the first pool party. And then I just realized, like, fuck it, we're going to do one next year. But in that go around, everybody else started doing it that was familiar with it. And it just grew. It grew. Next thing I knew, everybody was doing hood days. And um, me, for me, I flipped hood days. I took it and I said, fuck it. I'm going to start throwing these parties and make this money. So for like about 22 years, I made money off of, of day parties. And um, my following became almost like 800 people. And I could rent any building, any place, and pack it. And we didn't have no problems because, like I said, this is the beginning. And this is when Crips really fucked with each other. So it was no beefs. And so, you know. Um, there, was some, there was some beefs, though. No, you couldn't had, get the 60s and the eight trays at, a, at a, one of be, these parties. This is before 60s and eight trays beef. And then, yeah, we could. I had, I remember we had six O's at the party. We had, um, um, What's my nigga name from A Trade Gangster? Uh, we had about five A Trade Gangsters. Be Grave Streets. It'd be everybody in there. But these beefs go back to '79. Even the Broadways, the Faux Trays, no. the Five Trays. It wasn't beefs like that. It was just you got to. It wasn't beefs where you was killing each other. You know what I'm saying? We meet up, we squabble, and then that's that's it. It was no fuck your hood and this and that and that. It's he did this and we gonna deal with that dude. That's what it was. And so. Like I said, if that was the case, the first beef is East Coast and Hoover's. And we was in the park. And we was there at Manchester Park. when he, And we was there for it all day. We didn't have no incidents. We didn't have no nothing. Uh, you know, all of us got families. Most of any of your dudes from the east side got family from west side gangs. Got families from Hoover. Got families from gangsters. I got families from damn near everything on the west. And um, so... The beefs wasn't like that, and then you got to, you got to, and I'm, t I'm talking to brothers that's out there right now that know what I'm about to say. You got to realize, we're not really looking at the time stuff, but the times is, we count months where shit changed. We talking about three months now, we cool, four months later, we beefing. You feel me? So this is the, this is the growth of the gang shit. This is the growth of what's going on because all of a sudden, because dick and pussy, we get in these wars. You know what I'm saying? Just like you mentioned the 60s, they trade gangsters. They party together up until a female. Most of, all this shit starts behind games that's being played inside these parties, inside these hoods. She sees somebody else she like, you go to jail, she play with him, you come home, you ready to trip. Yeah. And basically, that's a lot of your wars. I don't care who's out here and who's going to say what. They, everybody that's looking at this motherfucker know. That was the bottom line for me of all the involvement in the gang shit. So what inspired your first uh, party? What, what inspired your 87? Was it 1987 when you did your first one? What inspired that? Me clowning. But me. were you seeing other dudes doing a little bit of partying? And you no, there was no party shit going on. I was clowning in YA. I was in juvenile hall. And... um. Me and J-Bone, which is uh, Jeffrey Washington, all of us, we up in YA. You know, there's a few of us, Crook from Q102, Evil from 11-8, Boo from 8-9, even Horse, which ended up becoming a 11 Deuce Broadway, but he was from East Coast in, in the beginning. Baby Case from 11-8. I mean, I can go on right now. Shorty from 11-8. All of us is in there. Sleep from 8 9 and Dog from 8 9 it's, it's a bunch of us. And then I, I can, Monster Cody and them is there. We kids. Them dudes is older than us. And I used to clown. I'd be like, nigga, today my birthday. It'd be August 9th. I'd be like, today my C-Day, man. I'm like, no, it ain't, nigga. It's August 9th. It's my C-Day, nigga. It's my day. And the motherfuckers were like, boom. So when I got out, when I got out, I was telling homies, let's do this. And then me and J-Bone and his brother Lil T, we was hollering because we was in the same circle. And I was like, man, we can do 8-9 day. Let's do this. And so we, was, we put it together and we got some, we did some food. We barbecued in the park because we was cool with everybody at the park at Washington Park. 
We barbecued, and then I'm telling you, it was everything in the park. Hoover's, Kitchens, Compton Avenues. It was any crib that was in good standing was in that park that day. And when I say it was over 500 people, it was over 500 people, and I'll prove it to you when we get another chance. I'll give you a shot at the video, and you can look at it. And, um, you know, when we first did that, like I said, Queek and them from uh, – a. Trey Hoover was there. So the next hood day I went to was the following year was A. Trey Day, which was at Manchester Park. And then from that, you just started hearing hoods doing hood day. Everybody doing hood day, and it just grew. And everybody was doing it. And, and yes, I am the founder of it. And I say me, Jeffrey Washington, and Todd Washington uh, is the first ones that initiated it. I had the thought, and we put it together. The Washingtons are for also from 8-9? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so how did it... My nigga Bone, rest in peace. Much love. Jeffrey Washington, your family and all, homie. So when did it start becoming uh, more of a, a party thing and then the, the pajama party and then the yacht parties? When did it... Well, it was, it was always... You've got to remember, it was always a reason to throw the party. So it had to be a theme. I started getting smarter. So... I wanted. Uh, I created the theme, the, the the pajama party that me and you know about. That was twenty years in. I was throwing pajama parties before that. I was doing uh, uh, pajama party sleepovers where we was in the building all night until five in the morning. You know, renting it like that. World on wheel skating ring. I was filling it up. Uh, I remember we did a pajama there, pajama party there, and. Uh, Bert was running it. Uh, what's his name? Had already went to jail for child molestation, and Bert was running it. And we got in there, and I'm telling you, we came right when the church service was over. The church skating thing was over, and they coming out, and we coming in, and this girls in fishing that shit, titty nipples out. You know, we in th silk pajamas, we in all this shit, and we getting going big. So it's constantly growing. It's constantly growing, and so I flipped it. I turned it to uh, my hustle. Which Bert was this? Uh, Bert that was running World on Wheels. Okay. Uh, you know, I just knew him by Bert. Bert was solid. He was a cool dude. Uh, he got greedy on me. He That first party, he was like, fuck. Because feel, I filled up the bottom floor and the bowling alley. All they liquor they had in the bar, it sold. Not nothing there. Motherfuckers started drinking rock gut just because they couldn't get no other drink. So the schoolyards were also attending? They no? never came. And that was the funny to me. They would never come up to that skate ring back then. When they reopened it, then schoolyards was coming. Uh, when I was there, the 60s was there. But they'd do pop shots from up off the top of the hill down in there. But they wouldn't come down there. Yeah, that's because it's in their hood. It's in their hood, but yeah. it, I don't care. I've been places where it was our hood no matter what. And where we was at and we was that thick, it was our hood. Well, no disrespect to the schoolyards. No, 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 no. I fuck with my boys. Yeah. I, I fuck with them. And, and they know. I'm, I'm only speaking the truth. I ain't telling no bullshit. They, they, that skating run... If you banging, you're not going to walk into some shit where you know it's too much motherfuckers here that don't like us. And for them, the six O's was there. And so everything that was affiliated with the six O's on that west side was having problems with them. So they weren't going to walk in there like that. But they didn't let it. When they, they revised it and opened it up, they made sure that you knew you was in their hood. So what years was it when you was up there doing parties? Uh, Anywhere from... 86 to about 97, 95, 97. I say 97. So those late 80s uh, was definitely the 60s was always up there on the weekends. They was, they was up there strong. Yeah. It was up there strong. And when we pushed up there, we made sure we was up there strong. We made sure everybody knew it was uh, 11 to 4. It was 11 to 4. We push up to that motherfucker and we'd be in there until 4 in the morning. And, you know... If you weren't strong enough to be in there, you weren't deep enough to be in there, you, you was out of place. So what, why did you um, eventually stop doing these parties? Uh, actually, I didn't stop. I flipped it from gang situation to more anybody wanted to come could come. You know, we had the dice games. Uh, we had uh, just – I had so many ways to make money I didn't have to sell drugs. I had all the party favorites. I had all the – I had the door. So – my money was good. You know, I, I would go home with about like $8,000 a party, and I'd throw two parties a month. And I lived off that for like almost 20 years. Now, one of, one of your parties in uh, 2008 had some gunfire in there. Uh, can you speak on that? 2008, which party? I think it was the one that kind of kicked off the beef with the grapes. 
No, that was was it two thousand eight? Yeah, it was two thousand eight. <laughs> it was. Now that that now that was that was that this, that was your party though, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it was my club. That was okay. Let's talk about that. You actually had a a brick and mortar club, right? Yeah, the Master Link. Okay. I was a uh, uh, cool with the dude that actually had it, and uh, he seen that I could throw the parties, so he went on and worked with me. And they, you know, I had parties everywhere. We started calling parties club scrape to all my coasters. Y'all remember that shit? My faux trades. Y'all remember that shit? Club scrape. You know, that's when the ecstasy pills got cracking, and motherfuckers was in there buck fuck wild. Females was in there buck fuck wild. And um, <laughs> so we check that because Chas Chas and okay. Um, so uh, these parties, you know, what I'm saying I was making a living off. I was taking care of my family off of it. Uh, my girl that I told you about, Tanil, I was with her for 17 years. Um, in this time, I'm throwing parties left and right. Just you know, my parties were more about more about my hustle. And so I'm, I'm like in New York. I'm throwing parties for everything. You drop your hat and we throwing a party. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's your birthday, we throwing a party. And um, so 2008, the funny thing about 2008, I mean, it was never funny because we lost good people and good people got shot. Good people lost their legs, you know. Um, hit man. Hit, yeah, my Key one oh two. He won't too. He lost his legs, you know what I'm saying? And wasn't doing shit. He just got hit in the back because of some bullshit. And so, you know, um BL was my boy. BL from Grape. Yeah. Much love to my dude. Mr. You know, Bullard. Up. Yeah. You know, his brother was my boy, Tweeter was my boy. I fuck with them. And like with me and BL, the the, the, the coldest shit was I could BL could come to the party with forty people. And pay ten dollars a head for each person, and they'd come in there. And most of the time, it'd be the girls. You know, my homegirls from nine seven, my homegirls from eight nine, deuces, different female factions they would get into it with. And once that would happen, he would just say, "Bear, we gone." He'd make everybody walk up out of. He'd be like, "Let's go, let's go, let's go," and everybody got to go. And we was able to defuse it before it escalated. This one night, um, it was it was fucked up. This one night, uh, the funny shit was, it was a light drizzle, and everybody started coming. This is the biggest thing I remember. It was a light drizzle. We had security at the gate, everything. But you know, motherfuckers gonna find a way to get their weapons in no matter what. So we had three security at the gate, and they was patting everybody down. And they was getting, they still got their shit in there, because when this shit went up, it, there was guns in that motherfucker. Um, so we all in there, we kicking in this party. And it just seemed like the harder it got started raining, more came. And it got thicker than it ever got. The building held like 200 people. We was well past 400 people. We was well past 450. We was well past, they couldn't, they, they, you couldn't damn near dance in that motherfucker because they was just so close to each other. And so um, we got a little, got, got little homegirl, this is my little homegirl, Piggy Bear. And if you she, if you tell them that no one else can come in, it's a problem outside, right? Well, I wasn't going to tell them they couldn't come in. They was giving me money. Yeah. So I'm just being real with you. Come on. <laughs> Shit. They in the parking lot. They everywhere. And so my little homegirl, Piggy Bear, uh, she's a solid female. She, um, she her family is from great. But she ran with the grapes point in time, but she never got put on. They tried to trip on her. Now, I'm telling you, she is hell on wheels. Anybody listening to this, they know. This young little girl, I'm talking about 16, 17, fighting grown-ass women and whooping that ass. Her and my niece, Lady Box, much, much love, rest in peace. Um, you know, they tried to push their line with her. And so what happened was, um, the grapes had brought, like my boy Bow Wow, he had hit me up and he said, Bear, is it cool if I bring some bounty hunter girls? And I said, no, nah, man, don't bring them because my homegirls is already on some dumb shit. Don't bring them because we can't deal with that. So they came, but they brought, I, I, um, it, I think it was Tank Magruder's son or Tank son. One of, them, one of their sons they brought and he was from Pablo Bishop, but he didn't know our routine. So if we got into it, BL would be like, we leaving. And I was able to get my people to stand down and stand back. And so they were leaving and we'd be done with it. But this night, it was so crowded and shit got cracking with the girls. We was able to stop it. Me and BL went in, into the, out into the middle of the club. I made the DJ turn off the music and I told him, I'm like, nigga, we ain't doing this. 
ain't nobody in here your enemy. We all homies. Y'all tripping. So the one dude come out the bathroom, which I believe was the boy's son. He come out and he busts in the air three times. Once he did that, it's up. Motherfuckers start shooting. Motherfuckers running. I had to save my homeboy a little milk because... They had knocked the speaker down over on top of him. I hear him screaming because everybody running across the speaker. I jump across the uh, bar thing and I push everybody back and I get him from up under there. And um, so, you know, the shooting happened. So the dust clear. And then when that dust clear, my boy is down. And I'm not going to go deep into what's going on with BL because there's a whole bunch of other shit motherfuckers don't know what's going on. I'm not going to go in that. I'm going to just tell you. My boy was down, four of our people was down, and it, we was trying to rush everybody off to the hospital. Um, uh, my boy Bow Wow, much love to him from great. Uh, Black, he was mad because it happened. So he came in behind me into the building and he was from the bus on me and, and I couldn't go nowhere. He had the gun and when I turned around, he's coming in. So Bow Wow went to him to stop him and he went reach for the gun and I just moved fast enough and I went between them and I snatched the gun. And I'm like, man, fuck that. So Bow Wow was like, Bear, just give me the gun. I'm like, no, holla at me tomorrow and get the gun for me. Cause I'm not finna give y'all the gun. This nigga was finna shoot me for sure. I seen it in his face when I turned around. He was nothing but 10 steps from me. And if Bow Wow wouldn't have moved when he did, I would've got shot. So I don't know if I'd have been here having this. I wouldn't know if I would have been paralyzed. I don't know if I was dead. You know what I'm saying? But it was that situation. And so when that was all said and done, there was things that happened that me for myself as a, a G crib, a real crib, I didn't like that happened. You know? And I mean, that's about as deep as I'm going to go into it. I vetted my opinion about some shit to a few homies and shit. We hollered. I didn't like it. And I, like I said... It, it moved on, and then the shit, the war started. So. so for the next five years, it was definitely a war between the yeah. East Coasts and the Grapes. Yeah. I don't know if it's officially over, but it's definitely toned. Tank, tank. It's, it's, it's definitely decreased. Yeah, uh, we we stay working at it because um, we used to have a song, that uh, a thin line. That song we used to use because we were so tight, and we just say it was a thin line between Coast and Grape. And, you know, we... We came from that gutter together, and we really stayed down. And there's a lot of brothers over there that want to quell this this fire and make motherfuckers understand the truth. It was a fucked up night. It was a bad situation, and shit went bad quick. And because of, just say, and I'm not saying it this lightly, just say motherfucker threw an M80 in the crowd, and everybody reacted. That's the fucked up shit that happened. And people lost their life, and people lost their legs, and people got shot because... As soon as you hear a boom and you know it's heated, everybody's pulling their guns out and you know the shit just went bad. It went bad. And I'm not speaking light to nobody because on everything I love, I love BL. He loved me. He fucked with me. And he got my utmost respect. Um, I didn't go to the funeral because I wasn't finna create some shit, some bad shit because it wasn't, it wasn't the time to even try to go up there and politic or say anything. All we could do was step back and let them, you know, you know put him down. And, and, and deal with it because it was ugly. And, you know, there's a lot of us that was hollering at each other. Like, look, my nigga, I don't know. I don't want no problem with this shit. I don't, I don't know what's up, man. I'm like, man. So that became the downfalls of my parties. That became where I said, fuck it. You know what I'm saying? It, I had to reinvent myself. It was That was over. That time of my life was over. Because now every time I tried to throw something, they felt free to fight. They felt free. For 20 years, I didn't have no problems. But all of a sudden, everybody, even East Coasters, I'm sitting there, motherfuckers getting dressed, ironing, and talking about if a homie get out of line with me, I'm going to do this. And I'm like, why the fuck are y'all getting dressed to trip with a homie? So this mentality started coming in play where motherfuckers want to say, oh, my nigga, fuck that. If they trip, I'm tripping. You know what I'm saying? And with no... No more coast love. There's no more where we can talk. So it's homies on homies. It was bitches on bitches, homegirls on homegirls. It was just haywire now. And now this new drugs is coming into play. So you can't control that shit because we don't, we're not familiar with it. You know, for me back in the days, you couldn't just be 
shermed up and you with the homies and stuff because now you become a liability. So if you were shermed up, either they put you in a car, they put you, we put you somewhere else, or we send your ass home. <laughs> yeah. Now, you know, motherfuckers can do whatever they're doing and they spaz the fuck out and it's just all right. Hey, people going on missions with the dudes that is now not shermed up, but now they're peeled up. Not peeled up, meth up. Meth up. Yeah. Cocaine <laughs> up. And maybe a pill or two. And then, matter of fact, if you want to say pills, let's just, let's just say pills, but look what's in the pills. Your chemist is motherfuckers ain't even went to school. They putting all this shit in here. They don't even know what the measurement is. They don't know nothing. They just dropping shit in this shit and saying, bam, my shit fire. Yeah. Well, rest in peace to all the brothers that um, lost their lives in that. And sisters. And, and the sisters. And, uh, but I wanted to ask you about, um, you, was, you worked on a historic movie, Iconic. One of the most popular movies ever produced that talked about this la shit it might not be the best movie but it was it definitely wasn't. the the first and eye opener and 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 one of the most discussed movie and we're talking about colors yep man talk about your connection to that movie colors and, and how did that come about so it come about you know um for our neighborhood we had the shares firestone the most fucked up police in the state of california i mean for us in the state of california i didn't know nothing worse than them um it was me, it was me, J-Bone, Lil CJ, X-Ray, and Lex. We in my El Camino, and we are driving through the hood. We coming up 89 from Zamora, headed to the park. And Nunez and Bradley and uh, this guy named Maverick uh, Morton, Rick Morton, and... At first, I thought he was the guy that wrote the movie, but Rick Schaefer wrote the movie. But he's there, and they pull us over, and they got us on. They got us on the hood of my car, and so we all around the car like this, and I'm over here, me and J Bone right here, and then it's Lex, a little CJ X Ray, and so Nunez started telling them who we are. He was like, the, "He's the East Coast Crib, East Coast Crib." East Coast Crip. When you get to J Bone, it was like that's he's a hardcore Crip. Then when they get to me, they say that's the shooter. And so I'm like, I don't know what the fuck you talking about. Yada yada yada. So they cuff me and J Bone. They let little CJ take my El Camino, and they take me and Bone to Firestone. And when they take us to Firestone, which is on Nadu and Compton Avenue, we get in there. Now we thinking we are getting arrested, and we get in there, and there's other people there too. And so we in there and um, they are uh, talking to us and then they start telling us about this movie. And when they tell us about this movie, they're asking us, do we want to be in it? I'm like, yeah, hell yeah. And then so Bone like, hell yeah. So they was like, can you get other people in? And we're like, yeah, man, we can get we can get many people to get in this bitch. And so they were like, all right. So they let us go. Uh, me and Bone clowning because the sheriff station is not that far. It's. Nadu is what they would call 79th. So we walk from Nadu to back into the hood across Firestone. And so me and him clowning and talking. So we get to the hood and we holler and we start hollering at home. He's like, man, they want us in this movie. Yada, 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 yada. Now, the funny is we turned out to be the most authentic bangers in that movie uh, besides T. Rogers. And in that one scene when you see they get the Bonnie Hunters right there on Central and Imperial, that scene where they arresting everybody after Craig get killed. And they, they got them hemmed up on Imperial and they take them to jail. And then they take us to jail and then the camera rolls by us and that's all of us on the window. All, all them are real Crips. And um, <laughs> so we do that scene. But prior to that, man, they had us from to be looking like, and this is no disrespect to homosexuality or none of that. They had us finna look like that. You know, when back in them days, 86, Venice Beach, you know, they used to have the, the hats on, the little hats with the big bill. But they knew the gang members walked around with their hats flipped up. Them was regular golf hats. Them was regular, it wasn't even the baseball hats, it was golf hats. So they was flipped up and we'd have the hood written on the front of that. And so when I seen that shit, and I was like, man, we don't wear that shit. <laughs> yeah. And Bone was like, hey, man, we don't dress like that. So... I had a hand in uh, working with the wardrobe dude, and we went down. We took him to Huntington Park because back then, at that time in the 80s, we either went to Huntington Park or Hells and Bells 
on uh, Vermont and uh, King. And um, so we took them to all these stores. We bought all the shit. We even, we even tricked them into buying us extra shit so that we rode around in the hood. We had jackets that said ENC, 8-9 Crip. And um, they d- did all that. They paid for all of that, but they didn't know we had that shit. And so um, we started doing the scenes for the movies and shit. Uh, uh, that shit was comedy, man. Um, I, I got much respect for Dennis Hopper. Um, most everybody else was scared of us. So when we doing the jailhouse scene and the Bloods is on the other side, all them Bloods was actors, and we dressed them. We dressed them. We put the rags on them. We put the. We I bought the clothes. I showed them the clothes to buy for them the whole nine. And um, and, and matter of fact, there's a scene in Colors I'm not in, and that's when they are in the back drinking a beer. And and prior to that, they all they got the homies on the ground. My brother and all them. I got three brothers that was in there. They got everybody on the ground, and they in that alley. And I can't think of the black dude named that's a big actor now. Don Cheadle? No, not John Cheadle, the other one, the one that was the blood. Glenn Plummer. Glenn Plummer. That played High Top. Yeah, High Top. He's there. And so while they're doing that, I'm down, I'm we in Huntington Park buying clothes. So when we come back, we in Lebedoo's Broadway hood off of Maine and 112. Dogman is my homeboy J Bone. So he the one say, Oh, hi, just your back, and he walking across the street, you know, authentic crib. And we moving on that. We doing that. We doing that scene. And so when I get back, they finish in the scene, <coughs> and then we did another scene down in uh, Watts, off of 110th and Lou Dillon. <coughs> and um, when we doing that scene, they had there was, there was some they ten line grapes. I guess they, that's what they was. <coughs> Excuse me. And um, when we doing that scene. They um, had a girl, the dude told the girl, ask them two right there, is they real gang members? And we walking by. And the girl like, y'all real gang members? I said, yeah. She said, well, where y'all from? I said, East Coast Crip. <coughs> the dude, he tell her to diss us, say cheese toast. You know what I'm saying? And, and to see if we were going to respond. I slapped the fuck out of her. When I slap her, Nunez grabbed me, and they pushing us back. And I'm like, fuck that. You know what I'm saying? This bitch is just dissed us, and you seen it, and you sniffed it, and you know what I'm saying? He's like, man, come on. And they pushed us back. He didn't, he didn't threaten to arrest me, but he made me kick back. And so after that happened, I'm talking shit to the dude, and my boy Lil John from Wad's great, Wad's Fadio great, he pull up on the yellow um, moped. He like, Bear, what's up, man? You know, whoa, I mean, this nigga right here dissing the hood, telling this girl to diss the hood, yada, 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 yada. He's like, man, whoa, whoa. So the grapes met us in that field where you see them drive the car through. Yeah. Crazy. They meet us in that field. We was in our in our trailer. Is that the field where you can see the watch towers in the background Before still? that. Okay. Before that, that. It's the field where she and the girl is driving, and she's driving crazy, and it's just in between houses. It, 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 she's rolling through that. So we met in there, and... um I just wanted to get down with him. So there was G dudes from Grape there. And they was like, man, you know, Bo Peep was there because uh, cause, uh, Lil John had, uh, reached out to other homies and like some of them came that knew us. So they came and I'm like, man, just let me and him get down. My brother and him like, no, you kick back. Look, my nigga, this dude did this, this, and this. And they was like, we'll deal with it, my nigga. We're going to leave this alone. So we ended up leaving it alone. We go back to the camper and then we do the scene. In that scene, that same girl is sitting right between my legs. If you look, when the Mexican's supposed to come up to the house and rocket past me the, the gun, she's sitting right in front of me. And I grabbed a gun, and he passed the Uzi over, and then I grabbed the shotgun from behind us because they came to the door. And that's the girl. So you did a scene with Don Cheadle. He's Rocket. No, yeah, we're Rocket. Okay. Yeah, I did a couple of scenes with him. Yeah. So, um, But J-Bone was the one that was in the car with him. And he hit the Sherm or the weed. I don't know exactly which one they were saying it was, but I believe it was Sherm. He hit the Sherm. He said, I'm fucked up. Shooter was his boy. The light-skinned dude. Was, that name was Shooter. And that was his boy. And um, and so and, and then Don Cheeto turned around, man, like, shut the fuck up, man. And yada, yada, yada. So when we was doing these scenes, we was getting up. Now, me and Bone, and I mean, you can look at the uh, critics. Me and Bone did the gang writing for the blacks and stuff. So... When the church, when the church gets shot up, um, that was supposed to be a blood area. 
So me and Bone was writing, we would write the blood shit, but we would cross it up because we was real bangers. We would cross it out, and the dude was looking. He said, man, why y'all always keep crossing all the shit out? I said, this, <laughs> I said, this is what we do. Yeah. You know, Bone was like, no, man, this is how we do. He said, but y'all not crossing this out. We would never cross out the East Coast shit. We never would. We just crossed everything else out. They was like, man, come on, man. Y'all gonna have to do a little more. So we had to, we didn't cross out the hood. We wrote East Side and with a C and crossed it out and did that. We wouldn't cross out the hood or none of that shit. We just was like, fuck it. They was like, all right. And then uh, the Watts Tower thing where the car flip over, you see it say E C C C C C C C Crip. I wrote that. J Bone did all the writing on the poles and stuff. And so we did that stuff. So we got money for doing that. We got paid. For the scenes, Bone got paid for actual voice talking, so he got a little more than us on on that. And uh, my brother, all of us was in it. My brother even moved forward from that, and it ended up in the Michael Jackson video. And right now, today, I'm working with Dennis Hopper's son, Henry Hopper, and we're thinking about recreating some stuff. Um, I don't want to go deep into what that is. Um, but we're working on some stuff together. I'm working with a couple of other people. Um, so I've been bringing in older homies. We got a game plan in play that's going to um, represent us like it's supposed to. Um, they're very interested in it. And uh, so I've been working with uh, a few people, Henry Hopper, HBO, and a couple of other people. Uh, we want to try to keep some real to all of this. So I got guys like Blackjack from Kitchen. I got uh, Sam from Hoover. I got Big Tom from Eight Nine. I got uh, I got G's period past me that are validated. I'm hoping I can grab some more other homies that will. I got some homies from Six Deuce. I'm expecting to bring to the table. I haven't put it to them yet because everything has not moved forward. But we want to we want to bring some light to all this shit. But me in this depiction i want our kids to see that we was you know brainwashed we believe we was willing to die for some shit man i've had 15 dudes standing around me talking when i shot their homies and i couldn't bow down i couldn't be a bitch i had to tell them nigga, so what you know what i'm saying y'all know we banging and and you know um i walked away with my life but i could have i could have easily lost my life standing there and and i didn't even weigh it out you know what i'm saying the biggest thing I weighed out was whether I was going to be a mark or be a down-ass nigga. Yeah. So I'm like, shit, I'm banging. Fuck it. If y'all got me, you got me. And that's just how silly this shit is and how silly this shit was. And so for me, that's my big picture. I want to expose how misled we were. Because if you look at it in the times of when the gang shit started back then, let's just say some from 77 up, dude, you calling your big homeboy is nothing but a year older than you. The only reason he's your big homie is because he was from the hood first. Other than that, y'all was probably running on the same elementary school campus, same junior high school. You know what I'm saying? Motherfucker that you, day to day, if you was walking with him, you'd be like, nigga, that's Ralph. He just, yeah, he's a year older than me, but so what? I do more than him. And, and, and you know, so that's what it was. It's, it's, it's kind of that saying where they say kids is raising babies. Same situation. Kids was raising gang members. You know what I'm saying? And, and, and we believed the rhetoric. We was with the rhetoric. Yeah. It, no matter what. You know what I'm saying? I really thought I was that motherfucker. I got shot several times and I still was like, still I'm finna go back out here and shoot me some people. So, you know, it's, it's, I want to expose that lie. I won't, I don't, I, I mean, my biggest question to any of you dudes watching this shit, how many of you motherfuckers will walk your kid down this same stupid ass road and you know what it's about, that there's no success in it? The only biggest success is they get a big name and they're in jail or they dead. How far is that reputation going when they got to try to live and they got to raise somebody and they got to teach somebody? That reputation is going to do nothing for you. And I'm sure that uh, all of this inspired you to start the organization Baby, which we're going to talk about in a second. But I have I have another colors question because 
I want to know what it was like working with a young Don Cheadle back, <laughs> back then because he became, I guess you could say he's an A-list star. He's a, you know, he's at the top of the, uh, the food chain when it comes to this acting thing. But you had a young Don Cheadle there trying to play a, play, play a gangster. Hey, man, look. And the funny, you asking that question again, it actually, it, I should have been asking him what I was talking about. Because even when we did that scene, and that scene was in Lincoln Heights jail. It used to be the drunk take for the older people back in the before our up being grown. It shit. used to be a real prison, real jail, but jail. they use it for the movies now. They, they, yeah, it used to be what they called the drunk tank. So if you wherever you was in L.A., if you got arrested for drunk DUI, they took you to Lincoln Heights, and it, it looked like a county jail. We wasn't even in the county jail; we was there. And that it looked just like the county. When you see Frog in there, you see all of us in there, motherfuckers. Now when he's getting released, he's getting released from the back end of the county jail. There's no way he was inside of it. They you see yeah, him come just, out that it looked they, like he coming out yeah, that door. They just cut to it. Yeah. Right. They cut to it. But really everything was in Lincoln Heights. Um so wait a minute, what was that question again? Just, just working with Don Cheadle. You actually so, had so my with funny Don with Don Cheadle with them is this. Um that scene we did, they were scared. They were scared. They say, was, they, who who are we talking about? Damon Wayans. Uh, the, Don I, Damon Wayans wasn't there. Don Chino was there because he was. That's where you see the pictures we got with him and J Bone Shooter and them all there. This is all at this time. I didn't see Damon. I never even ran across Damon not one time on the set. Um, now the, la- the Hispanic lady, she was there all the time. She was cool as fuck. Maria Conchita Alonso. Yeah, Conchita. Yeah, <laughs> she was cool as fuck. Yeah, and then. Um, uh, what about Glenn Plummer? High top. Glenn Plummer, he was he was just there when we was in that alley. Other than that, he was all the other scenes we was never around him. Uh, they 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 would strategically did shit where it looks like we're there and yeah. they just put shit together and edit it, but we weren't always there. Around. Now, Hollywood is masters at doing this. Yeah. Hey, so you, Don, Don Cheeto, I, I just say this, man. When we did that scene, we scared the fuck out of him. When we, you see us reaching through the bars and we shake, yanking the rags off the head, we deliberately doing it. I'm tearing the pockets off the shirt so they can't wear them again and shit. We, we all doing it. CJ, all of us, we all in there doing it. And uh, they panic. Even uh, Mr. Ivory, they panic. They run down and send them home, send them home. And that, that dude, Dennis Hopper, come back in there like, no, fuck you mean? We asked him to show us, be for real. And so he liked the realistic of it what we did he was like no y'all did exactly what we wanted we wanted to know we wanted to put this on film on what y'all would do and then we did and you and you uh meant you, you mentioned frog you actually met frog on set yeah that's we met frog he Tr- was trinidad silva that's yeah. his real name he was is he really from avario i don't know or was he just an actor i don't know okay he was good at, if, yeah. if he was he just played, an actor. well you know that's and no disrespect to no latinos that's their mannerism so it's not hard to mimic yeah. It's not hard to mimic for them. That's they, you know, hey, ooms, you know, that's they, <laughs> that's they get down. That's they, I mean, I've grew up with Hispanics all my life. You know what I'm saying? I had friends, my boy S.A. Tony from F-13. I, I, I got good guys that we grew up with and before the war and shit. So, and all my homies know it. We all grew up with some of them. And they were solid as a motherfucker until the war ended, uh, began. But other than that, yeah. You know, he died right when the movie came out. I think he was in a car accident, if I remember. I didn't know he died. Yeah. No, I did. I seen it. I seen it. I seen it. Uh, Rico Suave, the the police officer that raised up and said freeze right before they shot him, that was a real police. That was Nunez from Firestone, bitch. <laughs> uh, Damian Waynes, when they got him in the store and he humping the bunny, the black dude with the glasses, bitch, Bradley. Um them dudes done whooped my ass a couple of times. Well, I'm going to say that even though he was playing a, a Latino Mexican dude, you still got to have a little bit of skills, a little bit of acting. You just can't come in there and just say, hey, vato, hey. No, no. <laughs> that's why I said, that's why I said to you, that's their way. Yeah. Not, it's it's not, it's not an act. It's their lingual. It's their, like, like, I'm like, what's up, my nigga? What's up, motherfucker? That's us. Yeah. That's them. That's their communication. That's their talk. You, you know what I'm saying? Did you cross paths with T. Rogers during the movie? Oh, that was my boy. Yeah. <laughs> 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 we kicked it with T a lot. Um, our first interaction with him is when we do the scene and they got us all up against the glass. We at Carson uh, Sheriff Station. And they running the camera across there. T. Rogers there with us. And then when we in the Jordan Downs, 
TJ when he said sitting there trying to sell dope. Oh yeah, he got a table. Yeah, like, he got a hey, table. He I said, ain't I never like, seen nobody with a sell table. no dope like that man, dope. back in them days. <laughs> yeah. Hell no, selling dope off of a domino no, table. No, you couldn't catch us doing that. You, know, you had to figure out how to get in where we at. Yeah, I knew but, that was all Hollywood right there. They and, was like, I'm sure T was like, really? You want me to do it like this? <laughs> and then it, it was funny, man. For us, T was like a a a, a big brother because he he didn't it didn't. It didn't cross Crip and bloodlines with him. It was just hanging out, conversation, laughing, clowning about what we was doing. He's telling us he was really from out of Chicago, uh, back east. You know, he was shooting this shit at us. And, you know, we, I didn't even actually, and just being real with you, I didn't even actually know he was a genuine blood until we got back to the normal business and running around. And then I started running across him and he was like, yeah. I'm he, like, he's yeah. the founder of Blackstones here Black in LA. Yes, yes. And, and it actually, it. a lot of people think he founded the Jungles. He actually started in what's called the Bitty, yes, the City. Stones. The Jungles came after, after yeah, because they had a different set over there called the Jungle Boys, right off, right off of um, off of um, Washington, in between Adams. The Adams is where they at. All that, all that area over there. Well, T. Rogers um, did an interview back in 95. He said they had five parks back then when there was Blackstone, even a, a Queen Anne Park, which is on the schoolyard side. So I guess in this in, in this is 69 when he when he starts the whole Blackstone movement here in L.A. you got to understand the time difference. You know, it's small time but for us is a lifetime. So it could have been five months of a situation. Yeah. And then, boom, we into another type of thing. And that was how fast the gang shit. Like, I got dudes to be like, oh, man, he was from Hat Gang, too. Yeah, I was from Hat Gang. I was a kid. Oh, you was, you, you was Hat Gang first? Yeah. What's that, on 92nd? Second. Yeah, and we was the ones that lived on 92nd. But I was a good Hat Gang. I was I was at the top of the chain. That's one of the thing. most OG hoods in L.A., Hat where they, Gang. Well, they wasn't uh, a nine. And so my family, my brothers and my uncles, me and Boxer, we was Hat Gangs at first. But... This is at the time of, remember, I said the identification. So once the family shot my brother, Trouble, I ended up being, for me, I went, I went home. Who were some of the early, early hat gang guys that you looked up to when uh, you was young? Big Urbean, that's uh, Big Wayne, uh, uh, Jerome, uh, Mookie, uh, Don Knotts, uh, Skeet. Damn, man, you making me. Topo, which was Manuel, Bosco. Bosco ended up being from Harlem. Um, a lot of us ended up going to bigger gangs. Well, let me ask you a, a hood hopper question because with this whole social media and internet stuff now that's going on, whenever someone wants to try to smut someone, mm -hmm. they, they'll say, oh, you was from such and such. For example, with Brick Baby. Brick Baby's open. He said, yeah, I, re I ran with the Harlems before I became a 6-0. Yeah. Why is that a point of negativity when you're trying to, like, tarnish somebody's reputation? I'll just tell you this. You got to look at the flip side of it. Somebody's going to find something negative to say. I got blood dudes, dudes from Bebops, that'll say, well, Bear really was from Hat Gang. I tell them, well, y'all really was Central Avenue Crips before you was Bloods. So if we want to play this game, you, you know what I'm saying? It, it, like I'm telling you, at this time, it was a fast period, and it was going quick. Dudes was trying to figure out who they was. The eight nine families, they was eight nines with us up until my homeboy uh, Big Wolf Johnny Slaughter getting killed by Barry, and that broke us apart. So the eight nine families was cool with you guys. No, they weren't cool. They was a part. They was a part of you guys yeah. until that killing. Till that killing, and Wolf just had a thing about. Barry, and at this time, I'm a young dude, so I wish I had my, my uncle, one of my uncles here, one of my big homies here to tell you, um, you know, we were solid up until that point. And then I can remember the AGs when they first started out, they, they wanted to say they was bloods, but you got to understand, they wasn't bloods. It was just everything back then was young blood, this, that, blood. Come here, blood. You know, there was no blood and cuss yet. So when people give you a a uh, definition of something they don't understand it they don't know it they just say oh well they was bloods first it wasn't that type of party back then cuz and blood was not uh divining you know separation or nothing it was just at that time you got family coming from down, down south and all that and they was like what's up cuz what's up cuz oh you know and then so the Crips incorporated it and then you got to remember 
we was first. So a lot of the lingo came from us. Like they say B dogs. They use B dog more than us now. We was originally C dogs. We started it. We, we was the C dogs. And then they did the opposite and said, well, we B dogs. Fine. You feel me? Uh, uh, you know, like my homeboy, Big CJ, his name was Raw BJ at first. And this is at the time we kids and shit is changing. So he changed his name to Raw CJ. You know what I'm saying? So it was starting to fit the times. It was just trying to, everything yeah. was starting to change and starting to fit this. You got to remember all these guys we went to school with, Evil and all them from our family and all that. I, I mean, so many of these dudes, they know me and they know what's up with me and so they you, know my name. So you know about uh, Evil, which is uh, Clemon Johnson. He had his brother with Sinister. You know, you familiar with that family? You're saying it wrong. His name is Clemon Johnson. Clemon. Okay, my bad. His name is Clemon, <laughs> Clemon Johnson. Johnson. Yeah, and he's in jail for killing my cousin. Is that that's your cousin? Yeah, Dwayne Beatwright is my cousin. Donald Logan is my homeboy. Uh, Tyrone was one of my homeboys from nine seven, but he didn't actually kill them. Peyton and um, Peyton and um, Donald, which was Goldie from the hood, Peyton didn't even bang the hood. He was just affiliated. They um, he had he had uh, two other dudes kill him, but he got the murder. You know what I'm saying? Uh, and he's fighting it right now. Uh, uh, he just they just they just overturned it. They dropped Donald Logan's murder. They dropped Tyrone's murder, and they dropped Georgette's work murder. And that was the murder that sent him to death row originally. The murder that sent him to death row was the double. Yeah, Donald Logan's and Dwayne Beatroy. So you know, and and Clemens know he me and him grew up in school together. We was friends at one point in time, and then once the gang shit started, it became us at each other. Now I always say that the neighborhood families is probably the most active gang in L.A. history, pound for pound, for all the guys that went to death row or caught murder cases you all the time. You're out your fucking mind. You don't you're agree with that. You're out your fucking mind. You know how many? <laughs> no. Rag no, time. No, I don't, I don't care about you naming none of them. We name all these names. I of, name name of them. Look, Duck. You want to name some names? Wimbone, Dre. But, but they're small. Big time, small. How, how big is neighborhood 8-9 fa um, family? They're like from, eight, how many blocks is that hood? We're, we're about the same. We're about the same. Eight nine is a little bit bigger. Man, Eight nine is bigger how? turf wise, how? territory wise. We go from central uh -huh. to the train tracks. Okay, so let me ask you this: the most. Let's just keep keep it blood. No, the most no, active blood gang historically. Let me say something to you. No, let yeah. me say something to you. Let's do this. You can move around, and you can go to the sheriff station. You can go everywhere, but you can ask any dude from kitchen from back in them days. Any dudes in them areas. When we went to Firestone Police Station, they had the map on the wall. They had a blue ribbon on one gang, and that was 8-9 East Coast. Okay, so when it comes to Bloods on the east side, f who would you say pound for pound was the most active in the 70s, early 80s? 8 4 Swans. 8 4 Swans, okay. They'd give you your run for your money. I got a couple of bullets in me. Okay. <laughs> so, and I'm just being real. I'm not being biased. I'm not saying the 8 Nines wasn't getting down because our shit was raw. Well, I'm, I'm going to stick to the 8 Nine families. You don't know shit. You you on side and looking in, and I tell you again, <laughs> go up to a sheriff, go up to any Linwood sheriff was originally Firestones. Go ask him. We was considered the most wanted gang in L.A. No, I'm just saying in terms of bloods, I ain't taking nothing away no, from no, your no. cripping. But when you say they the most wanted gang over in there, we beef with everything. Okay, well let, let's just deal with arrests, convictions, and death. People sitting on death I mean, row. They weren't good at what they was doing. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's all. You are saying they got caught more? They got, they caught, got more. caught more. My homies. Okay. They couldn't get a snitch in the hood. When they finally got one, they did their thing. And I don't give a fuck. I'm telling everybody. Motherfuckers know. Even the older dudes from there, they know. And trust me, I can, I can, I know Time Bomb. I know Rag Time personally. I know all them. Them dudes was banging. The Banks brothers, Kelsey, Marvin, uh, Paul, just all them dudes, them dudes banged. You feel me? But No. We was we was so fucking dumbfounded when they said, us, I mean, Evil was a motherfucking serial killer. No doubt. And I didn't chase that motherfucker Allegedly. from Russell Elementary all the way over to here. Allegedly, though. Well, I mean, you don't get serial killer if you got somebody else killing somebody. Yeah. All right. Well, um, back to T. Rogers. You said T. Rogers was such a cool dude. And I, I think maybe that comes from he actually already had his organization, his nonprofit, his gang intervention set up. I think it was called Sidewalk University back in the 80s. So when you met T. Rogers in 88, he was already doing what you're doing now, but not to the level you're doing it. Right. And, and But I didn't know him for that. So I'm telling you, 
I'm a, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a gang member that I respect my G's, and T. Rogers deserved that respect. You kind of understand I what I'm saying? I think he's the first dude from out of L.A. with a with a nonprofit organization. I can't think of anyone that predates him. I, well, that, see, that, I keep telling you. Hey, this that's is, how me and you first met. And we got into it. Okay, you know, but, about my parties. But but T. <laughs> Rogers started. I believe Sidewalk University was founded in like '85. They had street gangs. No, I'm talking, which organization you think predates? I just told you they had street gangs. What, what organization which was is Becky that? Becky and all them. They had these. They had these. Um, they went street gangs. It was gang something. I'm talking about nonprofit five hundred one c three. You're not listening to me. <laughs> they had these tan cars. He got. He got. Um, what's his name? The, the greatest football player to ever walk the face of Earth. I, when I say Jim T. Rogers, Brown. you're speaking about the West. Yeah, you're speaking about the West, and then I, I mean I get it, and maybe that's the problem we have in here because you you're an East Side dude. I maybe. grew up on the West Side. So you grew I, up on so the East Side. I can't side. give you a history yeah. on the East, but if you I mean on the West, but I can damn near show tell you everything about the West. All right, well let's about let's, the just, East. let's just go into what you got. You got a thing called Baby Brothers Brothers Against, against Banging, Banging Youth. Youth. Yep. Um, 2008 Wood inspired Baby. Um, because that's really your. That of all the, of all the stuff that people will say you 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 are you are down for you know bears known for bears this bears that he did this, but at the end of the day, baby supersedes any of this street shit that you've accomplished. I agree. Let's let's what, what inspired that? Uh, shit, man, this is gonna be funky. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and this ain't no disrespect to nobody. Um, growing up in this gang shit, and I got to give it to you like this. Uh, blood, crip, I don't give a fuck what you is, Hispanic. We got politics like the United States have politics. No doubt. And These in, crips and blood hoods are like many nations. Yeah, exactly. And you got people that wants to be the leaders and they'll assassinate a motherfucker to be that leader. Whether it be meant, um, verbal or physical, they, they will do this. And you got people aspiring to be the next whoever they want to be. Um, for me, um, I, if, I'm, if I got to tell you the dead honest truth, me, I was considered, to me, myself, I was a follower. To my moms, I was a follower because in our hood, Zamora ran straight through the neighborhood, Zamora Avenue, and my house sat right on 92nd and Zamora. And so once I became eight, nine, um, it wore, the game started being played. And when you became 8-9, did some of the hat gangs feel betrayed? No. Okay. I think I feel more betrayed before them. Okay. Because they all, and I wouldn't even tell you no lie, a dude named uh, Chili from Avalon was with them one day, and I was working, I was about 14, I was working for WLCAC, and me and my homeboy and Shout out to the Watkins. Yeah. Uh, my homeboy and dog, we got off work, and we went in the neighborhood, and... Um, Don Knotts and them was with him. And he he was I didn't I wasn't paying attention. He was behind me, but we had just got paid and I had forty dollars in my hand. And he fired on me from behind. I fell on the ground and He dope fiend you, huh? He dope fiend me. And motherfuckers is looking at this. Or when they look at it, they know I'm not lying. <laughs> Desi, all you motherfuckers know. Uh, so but they seem to forgot who I was. So when I got fired on, he grabbed my money. And, you know, they took it and they walked away. And I'm like, all right, boom. I go to A9 because that's my family background. And I holler at a couple of people. They give me a thing. And um, we push back over there. And I hollered. You know, the last thing I seen of Chile, he was running across Century and uh, Central trying to get away. And um, from that point on, I was like, fuck you motherfuckers. And so that's how I ended up turning eight nine, even though at this time, and I'm talking to any hat gang, everybody want to ask the question. The motherfuckers told me I was the last Desi, uh, my boy um, uh, Ski, they would call me the last hat gang, you know, because I was still trying to bang. I wasn't ready to quit. I was just starting. They was, all, they was already toning down. They wanted to be dope dealers, and they was like, oh, well, you're the last hat. I'm like, all right, fuck it. You know what I'm saying? But all my homeboys I'm running with is eight nines. All my best friends, Big Sleep, Crow, uh, Lil Sleep, Lil CJ, these are all my best friends at, from kids, you know what I'm saying, childhood. And we running. We running together. I'm like, fuck it. You know, you motherfuckers are doing this. And then my brother got shot. 
Junior Bridges and them had bust on him, hit him with a shotgun in the face. Boom, I turned to 89. I didn't get courted on. I went busting. And so uh, that was my kind of my way of getting walked on. Um, I've been pretty aggressive as a young dude. Wait, so he got busted on by an 8-9 family? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. They put, man, look, trust me, you ain't going to work nothing. I tell you, we was like a movie thing daily, every day. We was the pioneers of the gunplay. So if you want I ain't taking nothing from the families. I'm just letting you know what's real and how it really adds up. They weren't the number one bangers. We was the number one bangers. I mean, I'll tell you this. We was so we was so strong and we was so at it that we affected a lot of other gangs. A lot of other gangs. Specifically the eight nines. No. Or just the coasts. Coasts, Hoovers, everything that fuck with my well, homeboy. The coasts are so you, big. You're missing it. My homeboy Duck had a touch so far that it wasn't even funny. He was loved by all. When his funeral came, it was Bloods, it was Crips there because, and we had to respect, this is 8-9. This is some mafia type shit. We had to respect that they was coming to show their respect to him. So we couldn't trip. We couldn't trip on them. We couldn't fuck with them. And matter of fact, 8-9 had to stand down and, and stay down with who was period like shit? Not, that's some his brothers. This that say homies. Y'all can't do nothing to him. It was homies there. That's riders. That was like man, fuck it, we can get them. Now y'all can't, homie. This is ducks. This is duck funeral, homie. We All right, touch so, him. so you was you was saying you back to the baby story. So you turned eight nine, and you're tying this into what inspired baby. So what inspired baby? I ain't got to go into that. Uh, uh, you know, no, that's important because we we I I I love that dudes from the streets start their own organizations and go to the schools and work with the youth. Skip Townsend is another guy out there. That's my boy. Um, that's who my who boy. else? Let, let's, let's, let's shout out some of the guys that's doing this work out there because I can't, I can't think of all of them. You probably know them better than me. Uh, shit, I got to give it to Skip Townsend. I got to give it to Taco. Taco from Gardena. Yeah, Wiz, rest in peace. Twin from Hoover. Twin from yep, one, yep. 107. Mr. Kevin Orange. That's Kevin, and his, <laughs> his last name is really Orange. Yes, that's his it. Last, his real and name I, is I, Orange. I grew up under them. I knew him. So, so you got to understand, when I'm talking to you, we was taught that we respected our Gs. You feel me? So these dudes that you just named, Daryl Ransom and them, all these dudes, we had to follow suit and we had to respect these guys because of their contribution to this crip shit. You feel me? I'm not finna talk no goofy, no sideways shit. You know, when we grew up, if they if they came in the hood, they were safe. If they came and visit Duck House, they were safe. You know what I'm saying? And it was taught all the way through. So we used to stay in the Hoover hood. Even though I was getting into it with the young Hoovers, Shit, the Hoovers are coming to see us sit right there on Colton Hoover and, and would not trip. You know what I'm saying? But big school, little school, smoke, all them, we got into it with them. I've been in a Hoover party where they started this because we were yo-yo, me and Jay Bone. There ain't number two East Coasters in there. And they dissed first. That's when the song came out, Rumors. And they dissed first, and I jumped up and dissed back. Jay Bone come out the kitchen, get up, and we pushing everybody back. And my nigga, um, um, Baby Charles, he, he, he make the Hoover's bag up. He say, move, man. So, boom, they letting us walk out the party. We on 95th in between Vermont and um, Hoover. And we walking out, and we in my Elko. And I give Bone, Bone got my keys, and I say, Bone, look. I see Scoob and them. They on my side. Scoob, if he see this, he know. They on my side. And he and his, he and his wife, folk, they busting the trunk open. They getting their shit out. And I'm like, look, man, they on my side. Just get me to the hospital. If they hit me, get me to the hospital. Bone, like, we're going to make it out of here. And we bag out. And as soon as the back of my tires hit the street, we hear two gunshots. When we hear the two gunshots, it's Queek from a tray, Big High. It's Day. It's, it's like five of them. All of them got shotguns. And they tell them they never going to touch us. They tell them straight out, y'all go. We bag out and we push. They don't bust at us or nothing. We able to leave. And we stayed right around the corner on Colton and Hoover. Yo-Yo and Baby Charles and Mac and Lil Mac, all these dudes is J-Bone and Lil T, the Washington's family. So they was like, no, nah, y'all not finna fuck with them. And we was able to leave. You feel me? 
And I'm saying to you, again, here's some stupid shit. We know we're not supposed to be there. I remember Lil' Fudd walked up to J-Bone. He stuck his hand out like, Lil' Fudd, because they didn't know who Bone was. They knew who I was. It was like, you know, Lil' Fudd, such and such. And Bone didn't even reach out and shake his hand. Bone sat back and said, Mr. J-Bone Low, 89 East Coast. He took his hand back and walked back over there to the Scooby in there. And if I'm lying, my nigga, my mom's lying. He, they, 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 they know this happened. You know what I'm saying? Yo-Yo, she had us in there. We was kicking it. All they girls we knew because they stayed in the apartments was on Coden and Hoover. And Smiley and Red and all these dudes would be over there. And they, they showed us much love. You feel me? She, we involved with the nine O's. Eight, nine. This is why I'm like, what? The families. We involved with the nine O's becoming neighborhoods. But really what they became first was West Coast, because they couldn't be East Coast, but that was because they was fucking with us. Me, Lil Big Sleep, Gangsta John, Quick Tongue, all of us used to be on 92nd over there when they fell out with the Hoovers and became 9-0 and separate. Yeah, they were 9-0 Hoovers first. first. There was a guy named Foam that got killed. I think he's kind of the founder of 9-0 Hoover or one of the early he line was, pushers over he there. Was, he was one of the ones. And then they turned West Coast? No, then Space Ghost supposedly killed K-Mac, from 7-4, which was Tracy Boo brother. That's my homegirl, much love to her. You know what I'm saying? To her brother, too. Um, you know, like I said, there was lines that was crossed that was cool. And when all this shit happened in the 9 O's, they, they kept, they, they, the 9 O's main beef was with the 107s, really. That's with the foam stuff and all that. The uh, Space Ghost supposed to be killing um K-Mac was something else, and that's when it was the final straw, and they cut them loose, and so the 9 O's became that, and then, like, Miz and all them, uh, my boy Babu, uh, Meech, Donut, you know, these all the, the G niggas from 9 O's that we fucked with, and they became, they first they started claiming West Coast, and then once they, once they went to jail, and all of us ended up going to jail, by the time I got out, they was neighborhood, and they was 90s, and they was from Je over in the Jesse Owens area now, you know what I'm saying? Because twin, the twins and all them was from that side. They was originally 9 old gangsters, but then they took the gangsters out and became the neighborhoods, and that became your 9 O's. But, um, yeah, like I said, man, A9 has been involved in a lot of shit. My homeboy, Gangster Ron, grew up in 111 hood. He stayed in the 111 hood. That's how the 111s used neighborhood, not the 60s. Was, wasn't the 11-5s uh, the first neighborhood on the west side? Yeah, but I'm just saying, yeah. that's 111. Yeah, 111, 11-5. Yeah, they all the same. Yeah. Back then, my, 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 my G homeboys ran with them dudes and did shit with them dudes. So, you know, I'm, I'm telling you what I, the history I know. And Hey, man, this is, I could sit here for the next mm -hmm. three hours and talk about this history, but I need you to talk to me about baby. So, let's go baby. <laughs> let's go baby. So, let me tell you what's up with baby. So, um... Some shit went down. A whole bunch of shit was going down. Uh, there was an attempt on my life. Um, I found out some bullshit, and I had to deal with it. And so, um, and I'm just going to be 100 real with you. Uh, my granny, my homies know her. Everybody know her. I would go in the house to her, and she would be like, um, come here. She called me Charlie Brown because my name is Charles. And she'd be like, come here, Brown. And I'd go in there, and she, you know, she was an anointed woman. She was full church on me. You never hear a cuss. You never hear a trip. You know what I'm saying? If she raised her voice, you was finna get your ass whipped. She was mad. <laughs> and so, um, and um, I rarely ever heard her cuss. And uh, she just told me. She kept telling me. She said, you've been shot. I probably had been shot about six times then. And uh, she just told me. And she kept on saying, God wants something from you. And um, so, somebody finna get mad at me, but I'm finna for the involve him. I know you don't give up. I don't. <laughs> so, um, you know, uh, some shit happened. Uh, next thing I know, BL and Emmy got killed, and there was a deal made to get me out the way because I was in people's way. And um, when that happened, I got people from Grape. I got a lot of family. My grandmother's originally a Graham. And she married my grandfather, which is a Smith, but she was a Graham. And all them Grahams that's from the Jordan Downs that motherfuckers hear me talk about right now, they know the Grahams is over there. 
And so my cousin came and grabbed me, um, little Rick. This motherfucker got a big ass grapevine on his face. He came on 66 and got me, and they took me and they showed me everything, and then they told me what was up. And so I'm like, what? So boom, now I'm scared as a motherfucker. Cause I know it's motherfuckers that I got to deal with that know where I lay my head at. The enemy don't never know where I'm at. You know what I'm saying? They, unless they've been following me for weeks, they don't know where I'm at. So I'm not that. That's not my worry, and I'm ready anyway. But these motherfuckers know one time I get up and eat, what I do, what I do, and where I go, and this and that. So um, uh, one morning, um, well, we got to go for the night. One night I'm at my spot. Uh, my homie, my boy Yak, he just came home recently. Much love to my nigga. You know, we had a little spot together and another dude. And um, so they got caught up. The spot got raided and they went to jail. And then I'm in there running it by myself. And there was an issue going on already. And the war was going on with the grapes and the, the coasters. And so my name was the biggest thing, which the funny shit is, it's always that situation since I've been banging. Once I got older, it's always been... You know, even when we stopped, uh, we squashed the beef with the six Earls. Um, I was involved with that. I was a big part of that. Me and G. Bob hollering, and then I got the homies on board, and we squashed that beef. We were out of the couple of people that got killed, we was able to kill that beef. And that's when we had the big-ass shit at the world on wheels and all that. But so in that, this shit happened, and um, the war changed. And motherfuckers were seeming like, they needed me out the way, and my get down was I'm going to survive. And so um, I was um, working with um, Chapter 2 with Mustafa and uh, PP from Q on 2, Mustafa from Swan. I finally went in with my homeboy, Big Ann from 9-7. I started doing the stuff, and I'm working up at Washington Park. I mean, at Washington High School. And the funny shit and the most craziest shit about this whole baby situation is... I met this dude, and he knew everything about me, everything. And he was like, man, what's up, man? And, you know, he's telling me shit, and I'm like, damn. I mean, he, he, know, he know the whole inner going on in 8-9. And I'm like, damn. But I can't quite remember him. You feel me? And I couldn't quite remember him, and I was like, damn. So he was telling me shit that was real that was going on in the hood. And this dude, life had got changed fucking with, behind me. Because he actually tried to become from 8-9. And I told him, I, I refused to let them bring him in because he wasn't born and raised on the block. So I didn't know who he was. So I was telling him, no, he couldn't be from 8-9. So this dude turned around and ended up working with uh, Marguerite Lamont. And he, he almost got caught up going to jail because he was a solid dude. He stayed down. He was with it. And, uh, you know, he took he got family. He got a bunch of family from East Coast. He got family from Hoover. He got my boy from Hoover, Rick. So he... Um, he, we on campus and we talking. And at this time, he's he's the guy over LAUSD, and he's building. Um, he's the one. The reason all these campuses are getting new football fields. And so we talking, and I tell him about what I want to create. And the reason, the funny thing is, we going back to what me and you was just talking about. Um, I told him I didn't want to be an interventionist no more. I didn't like the get out. I didn't like the setup. So I wanted to create something else, which was baby. And I want, and, and originally, baby stood for brothers, not brothers, it stood for bangers against banging youth. Because my homeboy Crook from the Q actually came up with the acronym. And so. That's an amazing acronym. acronym. Yeah. I love that acronym. Yeah. But it was bangers <laughs> against brothers, <laughs> born uh, banging youth. And so we run across my boy, Vernell Skaggs. We run across him, and he talking to me. And he was like, Bill, you remember me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I remember y'all used to play football in the park, the whole little nine talking to me. And I'm like, damn. I'm like, this not motherfucking know everything, but I don't remember. And, you know, he just told me, he said, you wouldn't let me get put on. So I think he tried to get put on twice. And he just said, fuck it. And uh, he started fucking around on campus. So, but all the young homies fucked with him. And so, um, you know, he liked to fight. He squabbled. They knew he could fight. He'd get out. And um, so um, he talked to me. One day, and he was saying what was up, and I told him what I wanted to create it. I told him about my program. And I said about, we didn't see each other for about four months, five months. In that process, I had been shot. I had a whole bunch of shit to jump. And I just, uh, I was finna kill a, kill a boy, one of my people. 
I'm laying on the side of his house, and I'm telling you no bullshit. Yeah. I'm laying on the side of his house, and I'm like, I'm finna knock this dude down. Yeah, you partially told this story on a previous interview. You laying down and like underneath the house, not side underneath, the house. on the side of the house, and I'm in all black. And then and you then have I got a- homies. I got two people at this end of the street and two people at the other end of the street. And we already said it. We all agreed that he wasn't gonna make it in the house, and he wasn't gonna make it off the street. So I'm I'm there, and I'm telling you this is some real shit. I'm there. I'm ready. And uh, my granny is on me. All I can hear is all the shit she's been saying to me. And I'm like, fuck. And I had already been in jail, sitting in jail for almost looking at life without, you know, for a gang of shit. And I'm like, man, I don't got no money. I don't got this. And I'm just debating. And I hear her. And she's like, you know, God got something for you. Now, me and this dude had already talked about baby. And um, he... We didn't see each other for a minute, and this was a Friday when this happened. I'm laying there, and I just, you know, I, I'm in tears. I get up because she just owned me that much. You and you know? ready to lay somebody out. No, huh? I'm going to do it. you going to do it. I'm telling yeah. motherfuckers know me. Trust me. Motherfuckers know me. They know my get down. I was going to do my thing. And um, I got up, and I said, fuck it. I'm, I, was, I was crying. And I'm boom. I was like, you know, I had tears in my eyes. I'm going to cry. And I went boo-hoo. And I was just, I had tears in my eyes. I'm, I cry when I'm angry anyway. So I'm headed. I get up and I say, fuck it. And I walk to the car. When I get to the car with my boy, he's like, what's up? But he's looking at me and I'm like, I'm cool. He's looking at me like, you sh- you cool? And I'm like, yeah, I'm cool. I said, let's roll. I say, uh, call him and tell him to meet me in my house. At this time, I'm standing on 66 in, in, on Broadway, in between Grand and Broadway, and 66. Uh, and so... We meet back at the house, and I'm telling you, I just told him straight up. I said, you know what? I'm going to leave it alone. I'm going to let God handle it. Shout out to Granny, though. Yeah. Shout out to Granny. Don't Tell everybody man. your grandmother's name, man. Edith Smith. Damn. I'm just Edith don't Smith. do this to me because I'm not going to. But, yo, Edith Smith saved a life, and she probably don't realize it, but this, this she didn't, is so, She didn't save many lives. It's so important to, like, for, for people to give us these these uh, words that sometimes we don't necessarily accept it at the time but then later it hits us and we we are moved by those words from our loved ones whether it's a granny or a grandfather or an uncle or an auntie and i just want to say hey all you grannies and grandfathers and uncles and aunties out there don't stop doing what you do because y'all save lives go ahead bear so um and this shit was funny um we got up, we went to the house, we hollered, they left. They was like, you good? I said, I'm good. So um, I go back to work Monday. I'm at Washington High School, and my boy walk up to me out of the blue. And he just said, he said, hey, Bear, what's up with that program you was talking about? I say, well, I know what I want to do. I don't know, I don't know how, how to go about doing it. And he said, well, I got this number. Call this number. And I said, all right. So, bam, I called the number. And I met this guy named Phil up here at uh, Rancho's Park. And when I met him, turn around, I knew him. Uh, he was from out of eight trades, but he ran with a lot of us out the coast. He ran around in the six-pack. Shout out to my boy Phil. He's still up there. And um, um, there. so he gave me a number, was a lawyer. I called the lawyer and set up a meeting with him. I didn't even tell this dude when we was meeting. When we got to the meeting, uh, Beverly Hills police police felt, followed us, and we was able to pull into the underground parking. And me and Crook from the queue, we went upstairs, and my boy was in there, and um, he um, we um, sat down, and he you know he called me Charles. He went he didn't call me Bear, did him. He just called me Charles, and he was like, um, "All right, so we here." And he said, well, Charles, tell them what your program is. And so I told him, I said, I want to do prevention. I don't want to do intervention. I don't want to do none of that. I want to do something that we can change the kids prior to them going into gangs. I want to show them what the gang strategy is, uh, what's expected, what they want you to do, and what it's going to cost you. And so when I told uh, Ken Seaton, that was his, that's his name, uh, I told him what was up, and Ken Seaton told us, man, that's a sound program he said you could be a 125 million dollar program my boy still didn't stop there he's like um he pulled his checkbook out and he said how much do it get how much do it cost to get it started 
And no, he said, how much do it cost? And they said 2700 to get the 501c3. So I was like, I'm just basically really listening because now he talking. And he's like, um, well, how much you need to start it? He took his own checkbook out, wrote a check for $900, gave it to him. And he asked me, he said, can you handle the rest? I was like, yeah, because I threw parties anyway, so I knew I could get the money up. So from that, baby began. Within 90 days, we had the 501c3. And, um, you know, that's been my fight every day. Now, you, you in a bunch of uh, middle schools, you're in a bunch of uh, places here that are known in South LA. High schools. Uh, talk about all the, the schools that you're currently working in. Um, I'm working in uh, View Park. Well, ICEF, here's the funny. He, he don't never take claim in none of this shit, man. Who? Excuse me for my tears, my boy. Vernell. Oh, Vernell, who's sitting off camera right now. Yeah, he right there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he always pop up at the right time. He um he wouldn't he never wanted to take claim to nothing. He was like, boom, I started walking my own contract and uh, he's there and he can verify it. I'm riding the bus from Compton, the train, and I'm going all the way off uh, from there to Adams and Arlington to this first school that my son went to. My son had a problem there and I went up there and um I inter- I met Mr. Watts and I met um uh Kene Washington and when I met them I was like, you know, I was telling them about my program because now I'm, by this time, I am a 501, 501c3. And that's why I give a shout out to my boy Skip and Big Watt from Harlem. I give a shout out to both of them because they validated me on this. I'm on campus and they bring me on. My son, they got into some trouble. And so that's how I met these two guys. And um, they said, we want you to come speak. And so I go up there and speak. Now they had a list of 21 kids that was what they considered their problem kids. I picked 26 of them, but I had all of the 21. And so Mr. Watts and Kene was like looking like, why the fuck did he pick? All the ones that we got on the list, plus four more. And so they asked me, I said, well, I, I'm reading their mannerism. I'm seeing them, you know, I come, I, I, was, a, I was a child gangbanger. So I, 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 I could see their attitudes and they get at them. I knew who the alpha dog was and all that. So once we started that, um, before that day was out, I realized where they was claiming. Like some of them was Harlem, some of them was trying to claim 20s. So I called Skip first, Skip my witness. I called Skip first. I hollered at him. I said, can you come up here? I need you to speak so these kids know who I am. And he was like, I'll be there. So Skip showed up. Watt from Harlem showed up. And the funny shit is, when they came, as soon as Skip got on the stage, uh, uh, I can't think of their names right now, but the ones that was affiliated with Bloods said straight up. And the I'm, 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 reason I'm telling you this is this is the funny about how we fix this shit that we got going on. When Skip got on the stand, up on the, uh, on the um, uh, stage, kids set up. You can see already, I was like, that's the big homie. You know, kick back. And so uh, then Watt got, came and he got up on the, on the stage and he started talking. Then I knew the twins. I seen all them. And so I knew who was what and I knew who was affiliated. But they validated me. And from that point on, I was able to talk to them and listen to them. And I just want you to understand this. We, us that come out these streets and we bang, we got a power that we don't realize we got. And that power is no matter what, they're going to respect us. Any kid is going to, re- even the most defined kid, is going to respect who we are if our name is solid. So my challenge most of the time when I hit the campus was my name Bear, Charles Spradley, go home, ask your people about me. And most of them would come back and they would listen. they kick back, no disrespect. I didn't disrespect them, neither I didn't have to yell at them. I'd tell them to kick back, sit down, don't do this, don't do that. And I was able to show the schools that I was able to change the attitude, I could change some of the stuff they was doing. But for me, it really wasn't that. It was me communicating with them and making them recognize where they was default was and where they was fucking up at. You know, you yelling at a adult, motherfucker, you can't beat that adult. But you know the rules, they can't do shit to you. So you gonna sit up here and say, fuck it and fuck up and fuck yourself up. You ain't gonna learn nothing. You gonna keep trying to be disrespectful and you never getting nothing. 
and they're getting paid for you. How the fuck do you come sit on this campus and they're making thousands of dollars off of you and you get no education? You being a prostitute. Yeah. And not knowing it. They're prostituting you every day. Because motherfucker, no matter what you do, every time they check your name in on that attendance sheet, they're making money off of you. And what are you getting out of it? And I just made them aware of that. So most of the kids, I was able to get their attention that way. Some of them, it took a little more deeper work. And as a, as a baby is growing, I'm learning they need more nurturing than that. They need other information. You know, you got girls going through so much crazy shit. Uh, young ladies going through so much crazy shit. I, I, I'm going to sidetrack for a second because I just want to give a shout out to Erica Flagg, my little homegirl. She just got killed. And uh, we raising money to bury her. Uh, she was... She was strong enough to walk up to the homegirls and say she didn't want to bang no more and got courted off, but she ended up getting killed by a nigga that was trying to prostitute her. Is there a GoFundMe for her? Yeah, it's on my website, right, on, we'll, my, on my Facebook. We'll put a link in the GoFundMe for her as well. Uh, I wanted to ask you, is your program tied into the city of L.A. or into GRID or anything like that? Not to GRID. We tied into LAUSD and ICEF School District. Uh, we basically... Um, we. Um, we are partners with PV Jobs. We are partnered with Cindy Camlocker, which is our congresswoman now. Uh, she was a state senator at first. Uh, I've been working with her when she was a state senator. So she's uh, given us little extra resources that we're able to give the kids, like um, CTEs. So with that, I have PV Jobs that give them uh, jobs through construction, jobs through hospitality, and they're building other components to their program. And everybody I didn't put in there, they all um, have excelled. They all have got jobs finding like electrician, plumbing, carpentry, uh, drywall, and just at whatever it is, painters union. And they getting you guys in painters in the painters unions and all that. I'm working with a lady named Aida. Uh, she's the producer of Barry for HBO, and she's taking our kids in and training them in the film industry. I got four there. Each one of them guys are 19 and they're making like 47 to $55 an hour now. But uh, like, I uh, got to shout out to one, Malik Silver. And not to ex exclude the other ones, but Malik was my problem child. I had him since ninth grade. He um, ended up going to jail on some silly shit. I followed him, I went up to Boys Republic, worked with him, and now he's, he's so much, He's the one that's excelling the most. My son, AJ Alfonso, uh, he, they're, they're excelling. Uh, Malik is a cameraman now, and this dude is, he just today, while the strike is going on, he's just gained a commercial where he can still make some money. And, uh, you know, Juan Richardson, all these guys, these young dudes uh, came out of shitty situations. And they fought to get out of it. They listened to my path. And um, like I said, I'm just giving them pathways. And we just, we trying to fix our kids so they don't um, succumb to this gang shit. They don't succumb to this bullshit. They don't get out here in the streets and be prostituting. We got women, we, young ladies we work with and everything. So, I mean, you know, this is what baby's push is, is to fix our kids. Because I, I, I just truly believe this. We got to give them back their futures. The only way we can get ours back is we take theirs. Hey, man, I want to commend you for that because even though we talked about a lot of stuff, man, the, the, I, th I think this, with the work you're doing right now, is probably the most important thing we, we got to talk about. And, uh, I mean, I got so many other topics to talk to you about, but we're going to have to, uh, we're going to have to do a, another, I don't know what part it would be, probably like part four, five, or six. Yeah, we, but before we wrap this up, Bear, I got a bone to pick with you, man, because I pulled up. I pulled up in your park a few years ago. It was that Washington Park? I pulled yes, up sir. in there, and you had me damn near have to squabble with an OG, <laughs> with an OG that has fists made out of steel, and uh, we over there punching fists. And I'm like, I don't know how many more times I can do this no. before the bones in my hand are about to break. And Bear ain't even here. Bear ain't even stopping this. So thing. let me answer but that. But I didn't want to punk out. I just said, no, let's let go. Let me answer Let's that. keep going. So I'm talking to everybody out in the street. I'm talking to homies in the hood. Yeah. From First Street to 190 to 2400 block. Yeah. You lose no 40 ounce. A9. Big 40. If you dare to go in the park and bump knuckles with him, I don't give a fuck. He's, he's you know, he on drugs, but he's still the dude he was. And if you look him up in TS and all that, that motherfucker was pushing over 500 pounds of weights easily. 
And I, I, by the time I realized he did the punch, I'm like, I'm, I'm waiting I'm like, for why Bear the to, fuck would you do that with him? I'm, I'm waiting for Bear to say, hey, stall him out, stall him out. <laughs> That's my boy no, over I here. No, I was expecting you not to put your but hand I, up. I don't want to be, I don't want to punk out. But punk out, put your hand down. How did it feel after you didn't punk out? I mean, I don't know how many times I had to. Uh, About five. With this dude, 40 ounce, whose fist is made out of steel. <laughs> this motherfucker saw concrete. But in, my, in the back of my head, I'm like, is Bear going to come here and, and stop this? <laughs> By the time I got there, it was over when you was looking at me like, what the fuck? The way I saw it is like Bear was just enjoying this shit. Look at Alex over there. He about to get fucked up. I, I didn't think he was going to do it. I just didn't <laughs> think he was going to do it. I won't do it with him. He'll tell you right now. If we had him in here at the table right now, ask him how many times we fit. This month never is that right never but he did it one time with another dude and he was done Nigga, i forgot i got a homeboy that was sillier than that his name is uh uh fred mo and he do it every time and i seen him sitting on the curve and he was just fucked up because he beat his hands up <laughs> he didn't hit him in his face he didn't hit him in his body he went fists with him and he was sitting i say you stupid where did that whole fist thing start man this he, because he know his strength he knows his strength. That's just forty ounce thing. Yeah, you know, you look at him. Oh, he's a he's a drunk. I mean, he's a crackhead. He's the motherfucker is hard of stone. He's like one of the top of line crips in YA and everything. You know what I'm saying? So many dudes know this dude and respect this dude. I'm talking, and I guarantee you, when they look at this shit, they're gonna be like, "Motherfucker, he did what with forty? My hand was hurting for about a week. You Bear. could pull him up. And you didn't stop you this. You could pull him up. Bear didn't he, stop this at all. Shirt, with that blue <laughs> shirt on? He about this big, man. This motherfucker about this big. You just didn't realize who you was playing with. But I'm always up for a challenge also, though. Sometimes so. you got to recognize something that's going on yeah. with that. I don't give a fuck what he look like. He willing to do it? Wait a minute. What, what you know that I don't know is the question. Yeah, my fist was hurting for a week, man. Hey, but, man. Hey, and that's my people. That's my family. Oh, yeah, for sure. For yeah, sure. Yeah, I'm, man. I pulled you know, up. I pulled up on you over there at Washington Park, oh, though. Oh, no, you welcome. As <laughs> soon as they see you, they know who you is. Yeah. Like, no. Hey, can we... Can, come here, V. <laughs> come on, man. Come on. Yeah, before we wrap this up. The only reason I want to bring him in yeah. is he's my silent partner, but he's always in denial. <laughs> Look. He going to have to get closer to the mic or... Quit or, hiding, man. Quit hiding. Let me move over. All right. Uh, this is my boy V, and this is... Uh, the big reason baby got started, you know, he he didn't get metal into what we was doing and where we was going, but he definitely made sure we got up and got running. Any any words you want to say, V? No, just shout out to um, all the um, dudes out there that's in that, that lifestyle that's trying to make that change. Shout out uh, to those folks, and I always stick with people who are going to push you. I do want to say it's funny. Another guest you had on your show, Tiny Mac from Eleven yeah. Deuce Hoover. The uh, people he was mentioning, Baby Charles and those folks, those are his uncles. Those are his uncles, and those are my um, folks. Shout out to um, all my um, A4 boys, Big Doughboy from 6 9 Ice, the Washington, Baby Smoke, the Johnson, Snoops, and the all, also all of the um, hey, I, folks I, I, from A9, Baby Craze, and some of the other yeah, folks. Yeah, Baby Craze. People uh, who are trying to make a push in big, a positive uh, direction. So, uh, much love to those folks. Man, tell all the homies from A9, that's rest in peace, homie. And gave their lives for this shit. Uh, you know, a lot of these men and women, you know, to my definitely to my niece, Lady Box, to Erica Flag. She was August Blue. Uh, like I said, I got a GoFundMe on um, Facebook, uh, Charles Bear Spratley. Uh, you might see the baby symbol on there. But go on there, man. She was a young girl and she was trying to figure it out. You know, um, I don't really know her whole family history, but I knew that she wanted, she thought she wanted to bang. She started from Backstreet, and then she ended up coming to us, and the homegirls embraced her. They got into a big-ass fight with the Backstreet girls, but we was cool to my homegirl, Kelly, from Backstreet. Um, and, you know, this young lady just lost her life, and young, homie, and she lost her life because dudes wanted to pimp her. And, Alonzo, I want to say this. For, for, some, for those of us who are not banging but maybe affiliated and people give you a way out, you got to pay it forward. So I would say with Bear, his point was when he, he talked about joining 89, my best friend who passed away, Romeo from 89, he was from 89, all the people I grew up with on the block. So I grew up on a block with half of the block being from Hoover, most of them from my, my peoples. 
the ha- other half, all East Coast from 6'9", 6'2", 6'6". People I grew up with my age and older. Um, so I didn't really want to ever make a, a, a choice, but I had the opportunity. Oh, I'm sorry. I had the opportunity to choose. So since most of my family were from Hoover, I said, I'm not going to join that because if there ever is a situation where I got to get cracking, then, and my folks know that, I said, if there's ever an opportunity or a situation where I got to get cracking on them, then I don't want to be from Hoover. So I gravitated more towards East Coast. And when I went out searching, like, well, I'm going I'm to join. And Bear was like, well, one, the, I know the rules because once you're affiliated, if you grew up with people from the 70s, you know the rules as someone who's affiliated. I didn't live over there. You were required to be over there all the time. And he was like, no, nah, that's probably not a move you want to you wanna make. Mm-hmm. But another situation happened where I was going to get active on something. And Bear told me, he stopped me, he said, you know what? We know, we know your heart. We know where you are. But you got other things in job. the future. And Box, shout out to Box, also was yeah. in colors. He was another guy who was it like... I was like, you, you're you. not supposed to be there. But That's fast forward, here for. I was selling, I was selling dope. But Miss Lamont, Marguerite Lamont, rest in peace, who was the principal of Washington High School, gave me an opportunity to go to college. I went for the first year, and after that, I said college wasn't for me. I'm a street dude. I had a little money. I said when I get back, my um, Rick from Hoover, he was getting out, so I said okay, he he gonna get out. He already set up where he gonna do the thing. The very next day of getting off the plane from Virginia. I get arrested, and this is 96 when they had the three strikes, like you get caught with a gun, you got so many years for the bullets in the yeah. gun. I got caught with him going to pick up to do our thing. And I, since I'm affiliated, and I tell people this all the time, if you hang with people, I don't know how it is now with younger dudes Sorry, and how man. the game is, but if you affiliated, right. you kind of bound by those rules. And I was bound by those rules, so Sorry, I man. took the case. And I almost lost the scholarship and everything, but shout out to that principal Rest in peace, Marguerite Lamont. She wrote the judge of the court and said, basically told him the situation. And basically, my outcome was, we're going to send you. You got you have to attend school. You have to finish. You don't finish, we violate you. You do the full time. And because of that, that's where I am today. And she made it a point to say, yeah, you got to pay it forward now. So when I saw Bear, I already knew who he was. He couldn't remember because I was in and out the state. So I was telling him things like, man, you so-and-so, this, so-and-so. I don't want to get into some of those activities. He but, just knew shit. <laughs> but that was the point, and then paying it forward, like your your show, and I appreciate your show because I look at some of the dudes where, I, in my opinion, you pay it forward because you allow some of the dudes that come to your platform, and there's a springboard for them, and then they're able to possibly sustain themselves. So that's I think that's what we all have to do at the end of the day. Well, shout out to that principal, man, that allowed you to get a second chance also, we're going to put a link for the GoFundMe for the homegirl that lost her life. And um, we're going to have Bear come back on here because I have a couple more topics that we didn't get to tap in with, man. But I appreciate you coming through. Where can people um, find you, tap in with you if they want to communicate and get in touch with you, Bear? Uh, so my face, like I told you, the Facebook program is um, uh, uh, Brothers It's No. It's Charles Bear Lokes Bradley. Most people see me on there. They on there. I got so many uh, people on there. Um, my Instagram is Grump Eight Nine Grump at G at uh, Insta, you know whatever it is. Yeah, just Eight Nine Grump on Instagram. Eight Nine Grump on Instagram. Um, you can hit me up three one zero five zero eight zero three two six. Damn, he just dropped you the the digits. Man, I don't care. Yeah, I don't give a fuck. Yeah, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm still this shit. I'm still in this shit. I'm still living this shit. I'm still walking it. I'm just telling y'all, um, if I'm dealing with your kids, I'm doing what they need. I'm trying to get them where they need to be at to help you out, you ladies, you single pops, you single moms. We trying to educate them. We trying to re-educate our kids. We basically, like I said, my, our, our thing is taking back our future by giving our kids back theirs. So I mean, if you on board with that and you believing in, you know, I challenge anybody that want to sit up here and tell me you'll take your kid and walk them down this road. And I'm not even talking to the ones that kids did end up gang banging. I'm saying to you, I know you want to stop them, and I know you want to give them the truth. And that's the thing. We got to start giving our kids the truth and re-educating them. You got to stop letting motherfuckers label your kids as IEPs and IP shit. That shit is, yeah, you can do social security on that shit, but what, what challenges you giving your kid? Because all they're telling your kid is all they got to do is make a D. 
make a fucking D and they can graduate from high school. That is bullshit. That makes our kids not competitive in college, not competitive in the workforce. So, you know, uh, look me up, ask anybody. I'm, I'm trying to tell our kids, look, all right, if you don't plan to go to college, come on, get in this little construction program I got. They training them from ninth grade to 12th grade. The video program, they training them from 10th grade to 12th grade. And as soon as they graduate, we trying to get them working before anybody can get their hands on them. Before anybody can lie and tell them to go put $30,000 in the bank account and then they get $10,000 of it and everybody else get the rest of the money. And then they got to pay all of it back. So... That's my get down, and if I'm wrong, hey, fuck it. Nah, man, you ain't wrong because you're doing God's work, and I'm gonna have links to all of Bear's. Uh, all contacts. glory to him. I'm gonna give. I'm have links to all Bear's contacts down in the show notes of this episode, to his Facebook, to his Instagram, and to any and, and to the GoFundMe for the home girl, and anyone that want to tap in with me, I'm at Alex Alonso one zero one on Instagram and Twitter, and I'll have video clips of this episode on the Street TV youtube channel and i want to thank everyone for tapping in with another fire episode of streets and streets and scholars and bear got one more thing to say to all my niggas evil mind y'all know what i'm talking about and we're done